All right, I'd like to call to order this regular meeting of the Boulder Valley Board of Education for Tuesday, March 9th, 2021. Laura, would you please call the roll? Garcia. Here. Gebhardt. Here. Marquis. Here. Myers. Here. Sergeant. Here. Sweeney Moran. Here. Smith. Here. All right, uh, please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, I'd like to remind everybody that the mission of the Boulder Valley School District is to create challenging, meaningful, and engaging learning opportunities so that all children thrive and are prepared for successful, civically engaged lives. Um, so as usual tonight, we're going to start with the superintendent's report that's combined with the COVID-19 report, uh, unless I'm wrong, Dr. Anderson, is that? Th that is correct. Uh, thank you, Board right. President Marcus, board members. Uh, good evening, everyone. A uh, few things have happened since the last time we've met. We'll, we'll give you a, a bit of a quick update. I um, want to start with contract negotiations. Thank board members who were able to make our session on Monday. I um, want to thank our district team, the BVEA team, for what I think is a very strong start to our negotiations. We've already put in six hours um, of time together, really thinking through what are the issues that we want to discuss during this negotiations. Um, and we're at a point where we've identified the issues. Uh, we're pulling small groups together to dig deeper, and then we'll come back together in April to review that work and work towards developing consensus. So I just want to thank everybody for a great start. Um, on March 4th, I had the honor to attend the BVSD Sustainability Summit kickoff. Uh, board members, as you know, we have board policy that, that dictates that every five years that we come together um, to develop a sustainability plan for the, for the district. Over the past six months, uh, the Green Schools National Network, which is a national leader in, in leading sustainability work in schools, um, has worked with Dr. Gita Carroll, our sustainability coordinator, and Rob Price, our assistant superintendent of operational services, to gather data and begin to work um, to set, a, uh, set some comprehensive goals around sustainability for our district in four areas, education, buildings, material flows, and transportation. Um, so we met for two hours on the 4th uh, with two purposes in mind. Number one, to celebrate the amazing accomplishments and achievements of BBSD related to our 2015 Sustainability Management System five-year update, and then to identify new areas for growth and new targets over the next five years. Uh, we'll be meeting over the next several months, board members, and then bringing back a presentation to you in either our April 27th or May 11th board meeting. Um, to update the board and the public in regards to where we are there. Um, other exciting news in regards to sustainability. Um, last week, we, we uh, welcomed uh, an exciting addition to our school bus fleet, our first all-electric bus. Uh, you can see the, the picture there. Uh, the Bluebird Vision model is a clean, efficient, and more uh, environmentally sustainable version of a conventionally fueled 71-passenger yellow bus. The electric bus replaces a 30-year-old diesel bus that was scrapped last year to Denver Metal Recycler. While the new bus will showcase electric power transportation, it'll be a workhorse of the fleet. It has a travel main range of 120 miles, powered by a 160 gigawatt battery package to transport students regularly. Uh, and it's going to be on the road in mid-March. And the purchase has been several years in the making. It was made possible with federal funds through the Alt Fuels Colorado program of the Regional Air Quality Council. So very excited to be showing off our um, first electric bus. And then finally, uh, board members and, and public this month in Boulder Valley School District is marking a very special milestone. It is the 60th anniversary of the school district's creation. So as you may know, prior to 1961, Boulder County was served by multiple local school districts, which themselves set up some very historic schools, including Gold Hill, Colorado's oldest continuously operating elementary school founded in 1873. The artwork shown was done by a local Boulder artist, Steve Lottwaite, in 2014, and he captured the architecture of a number of historic schools. Um, Boulder High School, 
shown on the left, was built in 1875 as the preparatory school for the University of Colorado, which was founded in 1876. Art Deco sculptures that greet students every day and are shown in the photo in the upper left were added to the building in 1937. And those that you might know your, your Boulder High School history caused a bit of uproar um, in our town. A Whittier Elementary, previously known as the Pine Street School, shown on the right, came into existence in 1882. And finally, Mapleton Elementary came along in 1888. As shown as these photos, there's a proud history of education here in Boulder Valley. Following the School District's Reorganization Act passed by the Colorado Legislature in 1957, uh, many of the school districts across the state consolidated. Here in Boulder, there were two bigger districts that were formed, Boulder Valley and St. Grant Valley. Here are the minutes from the very first board meeting of the new school district on March 23rd, 1961. Um, really kind of some neat history here. It's a relatively short meeting and after board members were given the oath of office, they elected their leadership, just like each board has done since. Much has changed, but much is also the same. And so much has happened since those first days and I wanna take this moment to celebrate this milestone 60 years and honor the work of the many, many employees that have served in this community and Boulder Valley students in those past 60 years. Additionally, know that we have many, many families who have multi-generational, who have multiple generations uh, served by our district. It's truly inspiring to think the impact this institution has had over six decades. And so we're proud of this history. Um, and over the course of this year, we're gonna be celebrating the district's achievements and encouraging folks to share their memories of Boulder Valley so it's key, be on the lookout in our newsletters and social media for more. So thank you board members uh, for giving me an opportunity to highlight the 60th anniversary of our school district. Um, so at this point, we're going to move into our COVID update. Uh, Randy, um, if you will go ahead and, and pull up those slides. So a quick update for you um, board, tonight, board members. Um, I don't know how many of you remember exactly what was happening one year ago, uh, but one year ago um, in a few days uh, is when um, the Boulder Valley School District actually had to move to all remote learning because of COVID-19. Um, it's been a long year for sure. Uh, lots of twists and turns, lots of new information, lots of, of working together. Uh, next slide, Randy. But, uh, and, and I think just a lot of learning. Um, as we think about everything that we've done and learned um, over the course of the past year as a Boulder Valley Schools team, as our community, I think that, they, that we, we certainly have learned a lot. We have much to be proud of. Uh, it's just hard to think that it has been a year um, since, since we held that press conference at uh, Boulder County Public Health. Uh, announcing um, that we were closing because of cases of, of COVID-19 in our community. Um, but we have lots of great news to share today. I think that things are, are certainly looking up and, uh, and lots of progress has, has been made. So at this point, I will turn the presentation over to Stephanie Farron. Stephanie. Hi, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Uh, good evening, board members. I'm very happy to be here tonight and to share with you how uh, BVSD continues to respond to the pandemic. Uh, one year later and what we're doing even now to get everyone back together again. Um, it really is remarkable to think that we've been doing this for, uh, for a year now. Um, I've never worked so closely with such an incredible group of people uh, literally every single day for a year. Um, it's been a, a really remarkable experience for me. Um, so to start, um, we really want to talk a little bit about vaccinations, that light at the end of the tunnel so many of us have been looking forward to. And to start that, I really think that we need to thank uh, Boulder Community Hospital. Again, we can't really thank them enough for the support and collaboration that they've provided uh, to us in you know, providing this resource to our staff. Um, they literally are there available every time we reach out with questions or if we need to change appointments or do anything uh, like that. It's just been an incredibly wonderful, positive experience. Um, and we look forward to working with them in the future. Uh, so as we've reported before, 
All uh, BVSD staff have been given the opportunity to be vaccinated um, either through Boulder Community Health. Uh, some folks have found uh, vaccines on their own through Kaiser and some other opportunities. Um, and our staff have really been taking advantage of that available vaccine. We have documentation that 77% um, of our staff have received at least one vaccine um, and up to 30% have received both doses as of now. This past Saturday was our first uh, second dose clinic with BCH. So we have a thousand more staff who have had two doses of vaccine. Uh, we have two more Saturdays uh, with second dose clinics. And after that, we will be um, really in a good spot, I believe. Uh, we'll also begin asking staff very soon to provide their vaccination dates to us as their second doses are administered. Uh, much like we did with the measles vaccine, it will allow us to quickly determine um, if a staff person needs to quarantine due to an exposure and to help us plan for future staffing needs as well. Um, on March 5th, the state began 1B.3 phase, which opens vaccinations to folks 60 and older, frontline essential workers in grocery and agriculture, and individuals with two or more high-risk conditions. So we're really beginning to see uh, Colorado move through those vaccination um, phases um, much quicker than we had anticipated. And it's really a wonderful um, thing for us to see. So I'd like to give a special shout out right now to uh, one of our Boulder High School teachers, uh, Kate Villarreal. She shared this photo um, of herself when we put out a call for educators who had gotten their second shot. So great job, Kate. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, and we know that there's a lot more of them also. Um, so as I mentioned, our first second dose group was vaccinated last week. And by uh, March 20th, all groups should be done with both doses through Boulder Community Health. Um, and because we were able to get our student facing staff in our first groups of vaccines, they should all be a good 14 days out from their second vaccine by the 28th, which puts us completely on schedule for our staff to return after spring break with full immunity. And then of course, on March 30th, our secondary students are scheduled to return four days a week. Um, our public health partners will give us a little update uh, when I'm finished here on how the community is faring and what we can all do to ensure this return um, is on time. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Um, as we prepare for that uh, return of secondary to four days per week, um, expanding our in-person learning, we are going to be adding another layer in our protective uh, health precautions, and that is COVID screening testing. Screening testing um, can be a really valuable tool in areas with moderate to high levels of community transmission. Um, and according to CDC, a sample of at least 10% of students per week um, may really reduce the likeliness of transmission within a school. So on March 30th, we'll begin weekly screening testing at participating schools. Our goal is that every uh, week we will perform screening tests with 10% of students um, at each school. We will also continue to provide testing for symptomatic students and staff outside at the schools, as we know that that service um, has been a very valuable resource to our students and families. Um, our Save the Cohort effort um, through those mobile symptomatic testing uh, units has been incredibly valuable in keeping quarantine, quarantines down, sorry, and our students in schools. Um, and we will be posting a schedule of all of those sites and what day and, and what school on our website. The testing will be the same type of testing as our mobile units have been using, which is a saliva-based test. It's easy to perform. There's no swabs. It makes it nice and easy and comfortable, especially for our youngest students. The test is a PCR test, which is the most reliable test that's offered. Um, and we get our results back usually by the end of the next day. Um, so it's been, an, like I said, a very valuable resource for us. And we continue to hear only really wonderful comments about uh, how it's gone for staff and families who have used it. 
Um, yesterday, a communication was sent out to families with information on how to register for this testing if they haven't already. And we'd really like to have at least 40% of our students registered for the program. Of course, the more students that we get enrolled, uh, the better picture we have of COVID in our schools and the more cases that we can prevent through transmission. Um, that's really all that I have for our uh, BVSD update. And I believe now I'll turn it over to our public health partners. Okay, I think I need to ooh, take over sh screen share. Oh, yep, let me turn that off. Hang on. Yeah. Sorry. No worries. There you go. Okay, Let's see if that works. Can you all see my, my slides? Yes, we can right. see. Uh, there we go. Um, thank you, Dr. Anderson and members of the board. My name is Taylor Carranza. I am uh, presenting for Jeff tonight. Um, he was unable to make it. Um, so thank you all for having me. Um, our update from Boulder County. As you can see here in our slides, metro cases are staying stable. Um, Boulder County is this red line through here. Um, so we're remaining pretty, pretty constant in relationship to the surrounding metro counties. The decline that we've been seeing has been slowing. Um, you can see as we were going from an a rather dramatic decline at the beginning here to a much more steady decline. We're still declining, but it is a much slower rate in our overall cases count. Boulder County is currently in yellow, um, even though our metrics are leaning towards blue today. Um, today is our first day back at a blue level for our cumulative incidence rate after five days in, or six days in yellow. Um, so we are starting the clock over for counting for seven days um, before we would qualify to move up to blue. Our cumulative incidence rate right now is 97.2. As I said, overall, this is specifically Boulder County's cases um, as opposed to the state cases. Our cases are trending downwards. Um, our average daily cases right now, uh, today was 45 point, or sorry, earlier this week was 45.6. Um, but as I said before, the this, this slope is slowing, um, but we are back into a more manageable number um, for case investigation and contact tracing. Um, we are seeing increases in cases among particularly 18 to 22 year olds, and then we also saw increases in ages 10 to 17. Um, in the 18 to 22 year old case range, you can see here that CU is taking up a larger proportion of those cases than it was before. So today, for example, today or two days ago on March 7th, there was 59 cases in the 18 to 22 range with about 60% of those um, being related to CU students. Um, here is a breakdown by age. So the really key colors here is this orange color, which is 10 to 17. And you can see this little spike in early March that I was just referencing about an increase in cases in that age group. We're starting to drop down again in that age group. Um, and then the other groups um, are the 18 to 22 and 0 to 9. Um, and that 18 to 22 is this rising line right here. Um, so we are seeing rate, rising numbers um, in that age range, um, despite declining cases overall. Um, so we do expect there to be more cases as schools do come back in person, that is to be expected. We do still expect uh, in-school transmission to be low, um, but that still is a concern for us. Um, as we're seeing more and more of our vulnerable population be vaccinated, um, we're very excited to be seeing that our hospitalizations are continuing to decrease at a rapid rate, um, as well as our deaths are decreasing. Um, so that is exciting. So we will be seeing those numbers continue to, de we're anticipating seeing those numbers continue to decrease 
um, even as we might be anticipating um, some rising case numbers locally potentially. Um, in addition, deaths are down 84% in long-term care facilities. Um, and we are also um, seeing some connection there between the vaccine distribution and the lower numbers in our most vulnerable populations. Um, and this is just a slide reflecting the relationships that I just was highlighting. So the disparity um, between case relative risk versus hospitalized relative risk and death relative risk. So seeing these numbers decreasing as we are going into March. Um, our average testing remains high of over 2000 tests being administered per day. Um, and very excited to share that vaccinations in Boulder, um, we have currently vaccinated over 66,000 people in Boulder with uh, over half of those, so 37,000, um, having received a full course of the vaccine. Um, this is the first time that I've seen this double, the second dose number be higher than the first dose number. So we're very excited about that. So that's about 24.2% of the eligible population has been vaccinated. That number just dropped down as we moved into the next phase of 1B.3, 1B.4. Um, and so that, that we have a much higher, larger group that is eligible currently. Um, Boulder County has vaccinated over 87% of our 70 plus community, um, which the goal was by the end of February to hit 70%. So we're very excited to, to be hitting such a high number there. Um, in terms of vaccinations, we do, this is a chart kind of showing the disparities that we were seeing within the county of which regions have had higher levels of uptake and vaccination within particularly the 70 and, and older group. Um, so this is not all eligible people, just the 70 and older group. And you can see particularly here in the north um, east corner of Longmont, we have, um, and, and of the county, we have some, uh, some lower areas of vaccination uptake. Um, some other disparities that we see amongst vaccinations right now um, is that fewer vaccines are being administered uh, percentage-wise to the Hispanic Latinx population within our county. So the Hispanic Latinx population taking up 5.4% uh, of the, the population within 70 plus um, and the percent that have been vaccinated being 3.1. And we see this disparity um, reflected across all Black, Indigenous, and people of color, so BIPOC folks. Um, and you can see consistent disparities across the different racial groups favoring white, non-Hispanic folks having gotten a higher percentage of vaccine. Um, that said, here is a breakdown of percentages of cross of 65 plus, so not 70, 65 plus of BIPOC communities across the counties. You can see here Boulder is doing well compared to our neighboring counties. Um, and part of that is, and I didn't have slides on this, but I can share this information with you all, that uh, some of our efforts and coordinated efforts around vaccine equity have included a partnership with the school districts. Um, in particular, BVSD and St. Brain have both been working with us and Salud and other local clinics to establish uh, we're in the early stages of planning, but to establish weekend clinics um, for community members. Um, that's really addressing two major issues. Um, weekends have been a high need of having vaccination clinics. That's when most people are, or many people are available and not working, but also when many clinics are less available. Um, and then two, that and as a part of the equity endeavor, uh, working with communities um, of color, in particular in Boulder County, um, in partnership with local um, community leaders, uh, schools were identified as leading places of trust within the community. Um, so we're really excited to be partnering with Boulder Valley School District to be potentially providing a clinic on Sat or Sundays, I think is what we're looking at um, for community members that would otherwise not have access to vaccine and trying to address some of these numbers further. Um, so as always, um, don't let up on prevention. Um, as we are seeing vaccines um, 
vaccine uptake expand. And we have, uh, as Stephanie shared, really exciting numbers in terms of the amount of people we're now moving into the second doses for educators. Um, we still have to remember that there are large parts of our population that aren't vaccinated and particularly students aren't able to get vaccinated. Um, so we need to, to really continue our mitigation efforts with hand washing, mask wearing, screening symptoms, staying home if you're sick. Um, currently, the number of estimated people in Colorado that are currently infectious is about one in 194. Um, and yeah, so uh, we are really excited about those vaccines getting distributed, but we all need to continue to keep our schools safe and, and be cautious as we continue this, this endeavor. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Taylor. And I believe uh, Helene is, is up next from Broomfield Health. Helene? Hi, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Can you hear me okay? Thank you for having us as well. And excited to be part of this partnership. So I'm Helene Lanzer. I'm the Public Health Nursing and Epidemiology Manager for Broomfield Public Health. And so I'll, um, I know. Taylor and I have hit on some of some of the same things, so I will uh, just kind of talk through some some of the updates for Broomfield County. So, um, as of our as of our most recent week, so starting this week, so starting officially tomorrow, we actually have, have seen our cases kind of fluctuating a little bit, little little low, a little high, and so we're actually going to be shifting back to level yellow, and so that will be as effective as of tomorrow. And so I'll share with you a little bit more of the specifics of just kind of what we're seeing of our case incidence and positivity rate. And our positivity rate has um, gone up a little bit, about 3.8%. We've kind of fluctuated in the threes, got just under three for a few days in the beginning of um, earlier in February. And, and so in some ways, we're just kind of continuing to monitor to see where this continues, this trend continues to go. But uh, we have noticed that, you know, kind of an ongoing uptick a little bit back up into the threes. Our case incidents as well, the seven-day cumulative case incidents, that also increased. So as opposed to last, our last check-in where we were at 107, we're at 148 per 100,000 people currently. And so that does, with the dial updates, does shift us to um, that level yellow. And so that just brings some of the different, you know, awareness and restrictions and just really want to keep people focus on the importance of still mask wearing, all the things that we know help kind of bring back those, help those numbers come back down, still encourage testing, um, staying home if, if someone's sick. Um, so what are some other thoughts on why do we, why are we noticing some of these cases increasing? We definitely are um, paying attention to the variants that we're seeing in the state. And, and so we work closely with CDPHE, we work closely with Boulder County Public Health and BVSD uh, in terms of just monitoring this and, and, and we know that there are things that can help in terms of, you know, ongoing, you know, social distancing, wearing a mask, staying home to help pre prevent it, because we've, we've seen that a lot of the variants can spread more easily. And knowing that we have more of our different sectors of, of work and, and, and restaurants and such opening up, that, that could contribute to kind of that greater exposure. So in the realm of variants, I know that's uh, something on a lot of people's minds. We, we are monitoring that in terms of in Broomfield. We, we have seen a few of the different variants um, po poking up in terms of some of our, uh, in some of our outbreaks. Um, we have a school outbreak, uh, an elementary school outbreak, a couple high, high school sports teams that are um, dealing with an outbreak as well as a child care center. So we're definitely trying to carefully monitor if, if when and if we do identify these variants because we know that they can spread more easily. In terms of our cumulative cases, in terms of age groups, it's just sometimes nice to kind of see where um, those trends are, are going um, in terms of our age groups and, and, and just kind of a general awareness and, and things that are you know, on the forefront that are gonna be helping is having our, our, our age groups vaccinated. And so we also, are doing a really great job with our 70 and older and our 65 and older, where we hope to see a lot of these numbers coming down. But we are seeing a bit of an increase with our school age group. And so just to highlight that a little bit more on this slide here, again, we, we want to be careful in terms of we want kids and students and teachers to be in classes and in classroom. And we just wanna to try to 
reduce any kind of risk in terms of spreading if someone does test positive for COVID. So, uh, you know, just an awareness of, in terms of our high school cases and um, elementary school cases that we have a, a little bit more total cumulative that, we're, that we've seen. And then in looking at the statewide just regional trends, we have some counties along the, the kind of front range, either they're kind of at a plateau or a, a bit of an elevated incidence in terms of case incidence and some that are just kind of staying steady. So, and then you can clearly see there's a lot of the state that is um, in a, a sustained decline. So again, it's that overall, that whole picture of, of, as we've talked about all the other times of the layered approach of how important it is in terms of helping fight this virus and reduce any, any ongoing spread. And then just to highlight our vaccine success, which we are uh, really proud of. We, we've contributed to helping get all the, you know, the BVSD staff um, vaccinated that uh, Stephanie already mentioned. We're really happy to share that we've hit all of our childcare centers, other childcare centers as well, and helping to connect anyone that's, if anyone's still needing to get a vaccination, we're, we will continue to help provide that with them. We've moved into 1B3 which is, is focusing on our 60 and older, our um, certain, certain areas in terms of frontline essential agricultural and grocery store staff, and then people who are, are 16 to 59 with two or more high risk conditions. And, and we're happy to report that we're also seeing more vaccine coming into the county. And, and in terms of the just uptake, we've seen a mix of both Pfizer, kind of nearly down the middle, Pfizer and Moderna, and, and we're excited to get Johnson & Johnson um, on board as well, too, because that, that is just another, another great option in terms of one dose and, and showing really good um, information in terms of that protection for individuals. So we are starting to see more large-scale clinics across the state, and we really want to, similar to as Taylor shared for Boulder, we want to really just ensure that there's equity and access and looking into different areas and times and locations, days of the week to setting up clinics, both large scale and smaller scale and pharmacy partnerships. We have a new partnership with Thor Thornton Fire, where we'll be doing another large scale, a um, thousand plus uh, type of vaccination clinic and looking into other, other events potentially down the road at First Bank Center. And, and also uh, working with some of our community partners and building up our um, vaccine ambassadors to really help help pr provide accurate information, answer questions, and help provide access to all the different uh, community groups in terms of within Broomfield County and our, and our strategic partners. And then just uh, highlighting, again, things we're excited about to just, just share with our um, populations that have been vaccinated. 85% of Broomfield's uh, 70 and older have been vaccinated and over a little bit over 90% of our 65 to 69 year olds have, have received their first dose. So this is just very exciting and, and just awesome how, how well we've all been able to kind of roll this out quickly and then, and then continuing on those other targeted age groups as we kind of move along further. And this is just a snapshot of just showing where the state in general is um, in terms of the overall total doses of COVID-19 vaccine administered for the, by your counties. And so as, you know, Taylor highlighted as well, and Stephanie, we just want to, you know, say those usual reminders, we're washing hands, hand sanitizer, wearing the mask, all of those things we know are aspects of help staying home if you're sick, still that, you know, awareness of distancing and, you know, holding off on gatherings, being, you know, just being aware of just kind of potential exposures, because we really do, we want to continue to be able to support students staying healthy, staff staying healthy and, and being in person. And then our website uh, here is just for more more information and just our weekly scorecard. And that'll I'll stop sharing. Thanks, Elaine. Uh, board members, do you have any questions in regards to the data that was presented? I know that we have Dr. Abina here as well um, to help answer any questions you may have. Yeah, I have a question. Um, do you know if restaurant workers between the ages of 16 and 19 will be eligible in 1B4? Um, just we have a lot of teenagers in our high schools that are working at restaurants. Do you know if they'll be in that category? Um, yeah, so we, we, a lot of a lot of how we've started is that this is prioritizing by age. 
So in terms of identifying highest risk in terms of restaurant workers, but and then we have to just be careful that it's which vaccine that they get because there's some vaccines that are only 18 and over. So, so just being careful when we're scheduling events or, or when someone's signing up for any event, actually just being kind of aware of, aware of which vaccine that they should be eligible. Yeah. Okay. I have a, uh -huh. uh, I have a question on. Uh, do we have any data on? the hospitalization, the age group that's being hospitalized. Um, you know, is it in the age group of the younger, the older, did they have pre-existing conditions? Is that, um, because I've had people that have asked that question and do you have any data on that? Yeah, we have that data broken out by age on our website. Um, uh, a lot of the younger age groups will potentially be suppressed just because of identifiable information, but that information should be readily available on our website. I'd have to pull it up to find it right now, though. Okay, also, so some also, of the... Uh, we're seeing a trend, obviously, as older people get vaccinated, less severe disease, less hospitalization and death. We're starting to see a rise in that younger population of being hospitalized. Not that many more, but their percentage of them that are more uh, of the total hospitalizations are in the middle age and younger groups. Okay, and, and then the other last question is, uh, at both Broomfield, Boulder um, um, commented on the um, disparity on the vaccines. It, it, do we have um, some information on um, why those I, I i know you alluded to that that people were working and so they needed that those weekends off but are there other critical reasons that we could help solve um so that those disparities uh are minimized yeah um we believe it's a combination of access and vaccine hesitancy um, a survey that was conducted in um, October reflected in Colorado, the Coloradans that we see higher levels of hesitancy within women and particularly within women of color. Um, so we're, we're definitely do see some levels of hesitancy and how we've been addressing that is through information sessions and working closely with community leaders, um, recognizing that information is much more valuable when it's coming from trusted sources. Um, so we've been working very closely on that and then other pieces are access. Um, so as I'm sure many people are aware, it's been a very challenging system to get vaccines, right? And you have to know how to use the internet and you have to be able to get a last minute appointment in a location that might be challenging and you might need a car. So all these things add up. Um, that's why we are looking at, at different options such as mobile clinics, at community-based clinics, um, and really trying to address some of those access issues at the same time as trying to address the um, information and science and data behind vaccine. Uh, but, uh, Thank and, you for explaining. I don't know if I can add to that. I do think that the, the, the schools play a very valuable partner in terms of communicating to parents, uh, particularly many of your parents who may may not have access that this vaccine is coming and encourage them to do that. Obviously, they, the more parents are that are vaccinated, the more likelihood that their kids will also be protected. So uh, I think if the schools, and I appreciate Dr. Anderson and Randy sending out information out to our parents about the vaccine, as well as uh, the, the virus itself, is always very helpful in terms of getting people uh, to, to get in the information that they need to make the best choice possible. You know, for the uh, uh, one thing I can say about public health is that they have not been reluctant at all in reaching out to the Latino led organizations for support and for some assistance. And I can really appreciate that because it's those partners that are going to make a difference, especially with the health, the disparity rates for. Uh, Latino students. And I thank you very much, Health Department, for not being reluctant at all to reach out to the Latino community. I'd, I'd like to add that some of our, oh, sorry, Helene. Uh, <laughs> some of our nurses are also speaking with uh, parent groups at the schools. Um, and we have uh, uh, two nurses that are uh, fluent in Spanish, and they have been asked uh, to work with the um, the community engagement group, uh, family and partnership group, 
uh, to do some presentations and talk about the vaccine and some other questions around testing and things like that as well. Thank you. I've seen some uh, also good information from uh, not only social media and different sites and religious organizations really uh, helping people to understand the impact. So thanks. Kathy? The only thing, other thing I was just going to add was just um, that we, we really value, if again, anyone on this call, we, we're, we're super thrilled that we have such high numbers of that 70 and older. But literally just today, I signed up two people who are 84 and 82. So if you know a neighbor or a student and their grandmother lives with them and still haven't had access, we, you know, that, that's what's so, there's a, so not a lot of good things that have come out of COVID, but the, the increased partnerships that we all have together that you guys now have, you know, access to Taylor and myself in terms of we will get them in right away. <laughs> like we, if there's anybody out there, you know, 65 and older especially will be prioritized. So, you know, just please keep that in mind if there's any, you know, student that you end up knowing of a, a grandparent, some, whoever, we want to help get them access to vaccine right away. Okay, Kathy and then Stacy. I was going to have Stacy go because she always has to go last. So I'll go after Stacy. <laughs> Thank you, Kathy. My question is for Stephanie. Um, I was wondering about the random testing. So um, I know you clarified, but I think it's worth repeating that families opt in not opt out um, because I know there's a lot of concern about that. And then my question is, how does that work in the school? Do they get pulled out? Do they do it during lunch? How does that work? So a, a, that's a great question. A lot of that is still being worked out. Um, you know, we have traditionally up until this year done hearing and vision screenings at all of our schools. And so we have systems already in place to be able to uh, pull students from class uh, take them to a place, uh, you know, for their hearing or vision screening. And we're anticipating setting uh, a similar model to that up. So schools will get a list of students every week that they will be um, asked to kind of help us gather, uh, take to a location to have the testing done and then go right back into their class. So it'll be much quicker because they don't have to go outside and it'll be uh, within the school. We'll keep symptomatic individuals outside of the school uh, for testing so that we don't have anybody coming in. Um, but you are correct. This is an opt-in um, procedure. So you have to go online to our uh, BVSD website, uh, sign up for uh, the COVID check um, mobile testing, and you sign up for random uh, school screening testing, and uh, then you are in the process. You can still sign up for a one-time only if that's what you want. Um, and then you can take your child to one of the testing sites or to Centaurus and have them tested there. But um, we're hoping as many folks um, will sign up and, and do the, uh, the random screening as possible. And as a, as a follow-up, um, is this just for middle and high or is it for elementary too? I wasn't clear about that. We'll be going to every school. So all the schools, elementary through high school. So I have a quick question as myself that I forgot to ask. Um, uh, recently, I know of a teacher that was uh, through her phone message that she had been come in contact uh, within some, with someone that had been um, tested positive. So she was quarantined. After they're fully vaccinated, Will this be an issue, and how long uh, does that immunity last? Do we have an answer or, or any data on that? So I can tell you right now, and then I'll let Dr. Urbina kind of uh, chime in here, um, that for, for us right now, two weeks after your second dose of vaccine, you are considered fully immunized. And a staff person who has been exposed in school or, you know, even potentially through, uh, like you said, notified through the mobile app would not have to quarantine in most circumstances. Um, there might be a circumstance that they are, are at high risk or work with high risk individuals or uh, potentially if it's a variant or something that they would be asked to quarantine. For how long? I believe right now it's 90 days. I'm not sure. We know that that'll change. I'm not sure uh, when or how long. Um, and maybe Dr. Bina would like to talk a little bit more about that. 
Sure, Donna, great question. Um, I wish I knew an answer to that question. <laughs> we know that um, vaccine protection is going to is likely to last longer than the, the natural immunity, which appears to be about 90 days. Um, the, the, the challenge will be how many people we get vaccinated and, and so that we can eliminate the virus out of the community with a combination of uh, people that have natural infection, people that are continuing to mask, because obviously we don't have a vaccine for children, as well as the people that are vaccinated. If we can do all of those, then we think that that we'll have a maybe in a much safer place. I think we're gonna we're gonna know over a period of time. Remember, all of those people that were in those clinical trials are still being followed, you know, in terms of their protected. So we'll know over the next couple of years. The final um, uh, 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 wrench in this in this motor or engine is what Helene mentioned earlier: the rise of variants and. As those variants are increase in numbers, we think that the vaccines are protective against those variants, but all of the pharmaceutical companies are now engaging in testing against those variants um, so that they can maybe consider another booster in, the, in a few months or so. So those are all unknown questions. Uh, hopefully in the future we'll be talking about, and I know Dr. Anderson would be very curious about talking about this for next fall. <laughs> uh, and so we'll be having this discussion after we get more people vaccinated and through the summer months. Okay, we have then a Kathy and then Kitty. So, um, Stephanie, you talked about how they would have full immunity, but you can still get sick with COVID. So I just was curious what full immunity, what that definition is. That definition is um, the fullest I would say the most effective um, response to the vaccine that we have or that you would be expected to have would be two full weeks after that second dose. And you're absolutely right. Folks can still um, contract the disease. They can still potentially uh, spread the disease uh, even with that vaccine, even two weeks after it. So um, again, why we have to be very careful. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions about people who have been vaccinated. Do they still have to do the daily screener before they go to work? Do they still have to monitor themselves for symptoms? And all of those things are unchanged. We still do a daily symptom uh, monitor every day. If somebody is sick, they need to uh, stay out until those symptoms resolve. And if it's past, 24, 48 hours, they'll need to get a COVID test. Um, there's really nothing different with this vaccine other than that um, ability to most likely be exempted from a quarantine. Um, everything else stays the same, masking, everything. That's really helpful to, to know that we still have to do the screeners and the symptom checking and you know yep. the few things that change with the vaccines. I think that's important for people to know. Yeah. So what do we do with the results of the screening test? Is there a tipping point where if we start to see a certain number of increases in cases in the screening test that we're gonna to have to change course or is it just information? What, what is, what's, I mean, I think we're hoping that we won't see that, but you've already acknowledged that we will see some increase in cases. So what, are, what does that all mean? And, I think, you know, right now there are no hard and fast uh, cutoffs or numbers. Um, I think it will be something that as we see rise in our numbers, we communicate with public health, we see what's happening in the community, um, and it's an ongoing discussion. Uh, you know, we could potentially see a, a, an increase in one school related to uh, an, an athletic event or something outside of school or something like that. And of course, we want to be very thoughtful and cautious in how we respond to that. But you don't get individual results back on this. This is just a, it tells you what's going on big picture. No, we will actually get individual results. So everyone who is tested, um, their test will come back. We will be notified as they will, whether they're uh, positive or negative. Mm -hmm. And the, does this screening, do these saliva tests test for the variants? They do not test for the variants, no. Um, and I, I will let Helene or, or Dr. Urbina kind of talk about how that testing for the variant happens and, and kind of the, right now, unfortunately, there is a lag time 
um, before we find out about that. Uh, sure, Kathy, I can add to that. Uh, thank you, Stephanie. And Helene, you're welcome to jump in here as well. You know, the, the, the tests that we're doing, whether or not it's a PCR test or a rapid antigen test, do test for all uh, 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 coronaviruses, whether or not they're the, the variant or not, because they're looking for a specific protein and or sp components of the nucleic acid. Obviously, the PCR test, the nasal swab, is a, is a more accurate test, but this is a, a fairly good uh, screening test. The only way to tell whether or not you have a variant, and this is what's happening at this all over across the country and at CDPHE, a certain percentage of the of the tests are actually screened for for uh, what they call an S drop gene, and then those the S drop genes, the ones that have that gene that's uh, screened for it. Uh, I, I, about 30% of those are screened for that. Then those that are positive are then gone through the genomic testing to identify the variant. So not every test is going to be able to do that. So uh, um, so I, you just have to keep that in mind that not every test will actually have that variant uh, testing, N nor do we need that because we still need to, uh, to implement all of our protection strategies, the, the masking, the I, I like the four W's that Helene uh, described earlier, washing your hands, waiting for gatherings, um, uh, doing all those activities actually protects you against the variant as well. So the vaccines are very, pretty good against the variants, but not, not as good as, as the predominant strain, but hopefully we'll have more information as we go through. But still, uh, we should protect ourselves against uh, all forms of the virus. So. And if a, if a test should come back with one of the variants, you would notify that family if it was a variant, or does that matter? Yes, we would. In fact, it, in, unfortunately, there's a delay, and that's part of the challenge, is that it takes a while for to identify that S-drop gene, uh, and then the sequencing. So we'll, we, we'll identify as, as quickly as we can, for sure. And then, Stephanie, I think it was your slide, but maybe it was Taylor's slide. What worries me is that people are going to not start to are not going to keep testing because they feel like we've turned the corner and and but it looks like people are still continuing to test at about the same percentage that they have over the past so that I thought that was encouraging did i read that correctly they have for us in the schools taylor i i, I think yeah testing is remaining high we've been above 2000 for uh test a day for a little while now and that we we just encourage people to continue to get tested if you're symptomatic if you've been in close contact with anybody that is known to have COVID, um, and as, as Dr. Urbina and everybody's been highlighting, continuing to wear masks, um, avoid social gatherings. Those are one of the, the, the largest uh, pieces that we see affiliated with school outbreaks, um, as we saw in the fall, and we've already begun to see this year. Um, so just continuing to be cautious, even as we're starting to turn that corner, um, we, we do still have to follow those things and keep our schools safe. All right, thanks. Thanks again for being here, everyone. It's really helpful. Okay, Kitty. Okay, I have a couple of questions, um, starting with Stephanie. I could not read on the screen what percentage of employees opted out of getting a vaccine. Um, but I'm assuming if among those employees, if there's an exposure, they would have to quarantine. Is that correct? Okay. Yes, and that's correct. Another question is, is if, if not enough parents opt in to have their students tested, uh, what kind of impact will that have and what would be not enough? Well, we would, um, we would, of course, like to do a different group of students every week. We don't want to be testing the same students over and over again. Um, so that's why we're really shooting for at least 40% of students in the school. Um, we will kind of determine how we choose randomly students um, based on the percentage of uh, students that they have consented. But we will try to do different students um, at least every other week um, if we don't get enough students that are signed up. Um, and you're correct about the, the vaccines. If a staff member elects not to get vaccinated and it's not uh, required, 
then they would need to complete the full quarantine if they were exposed. Uh, right now, I believe we have about 3% of, of our staff have said that they are going to sign up at a little bit later date. So they didn't want to sign up uh, right now through BCH. I think 2% uh, or so said that they were really unsure. Um, and about 17% of folks we've not heard from yet what their determination is, um, if they've already gone and done it on their own or, or what their plan is. Okay, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And then <clears throat> just for the public health folks, thank you so much for doing this with us at every board meeting. And I know you all are doing this out in the community. I don't know how you have time for anything else. And Helene, it occurs to me that Boulder, I mean Boulder, Broomfield is in five different school districts. So you have really got a lot on your hands and I so appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Okay, uh, Lisa. Thanks. I, I wanted to ask briefly about uh, this weekend and, and the incident up on the hill. Um, obviously, I think CU uh, or rather city council is planning on addressing ways to try and stop future incidents from occurring, but I think trying to contain a college campus in the springtime is not an easy task. So I wonder when we look at, on the one hand, the data we have from the last year about similar incidents up at CU and the way that that spread throughout the community or, or didn't spread, and as well as our success with our higher age groups in vaccination and our teachers in vaccination, how worried do we need to be about incidents like the one on the Hill last weekend leading to us having to, to shut down or change our in-person learning? Uh, I think I probably should take that one. <laughs> yes, we're, Lisa, we're very concerned. And, and in fact, we've done a, a big job of, of working with our very closely with our partners and the police and, and our CU campus to get out information, not only to all those uh, young people that were there and that to, to quarantine, to get tested, to do all the things that we need to do to identify cases early. Clearly, you're right, springtime for young people is really a rite of passage. It's unfortunate that they chose this as, a, as an opportunity to act out, uh, but we're, uh, we're, our CU partners are all over this. Our police are investigating it. We're getting lots of tips. Um, I, I think the, we're gonna be following this closely and probably show data at a future board, board meeting to see if there was a significant increase uh, in that age group. But I think we, not, we need to not only pay attention to what happened at the Hill, but we have to look at our extracurricular activities like sporting events, social gatherings, spring break. All of those will potentially have an impact when people are, are do, out and about uh, mingling without uh, wearing masks, physical distancing, washing your hands, and, and avoiding that contact. So it's just not the Hill, it's all of those events. And we're seeing, as Soda wanted me to mention, we're seeing a rise in, in the number of uh, the multi-inflammatory system uh, uh, system in children, the MISC uh, in Colorado. And so we're very concerned about that as a late sequelae of infection in children. I don't wanna call out panic at all, but I think we're not, we need to still pay attention to this. And I think the schools have done an excellent job uh, of, of adding layers, as Randy likes to say, of uh, protection, because I, I think, Kids are safer in schools than they are out in the community, but I think all of these activities, vaccination and all our activities out in the community, hopefully will not only make our community safe, but schools safe indirectly. Thanks. Okay, um, board members, any other questions that have come to mind? Richard. I, I just had a quick question for uh, Helene from Broomfield. Uh, I'm real familiar with the uh, nonprofits in Boulder County, uh, but I'm not that familiar with the nonprofits in, in uh, Broomfield County. Do you have any Latino serving nonprofits that you're working with in Boulder in Broomfield County? Um, we do. We, we um, a few things are under our uh, Broomfield uh, community network, and we actually have a lot of different faith-based and other businesses and schools that partnerships that that we all kind of have a monthly collaboration as well as an email network that gets hooked up but then specifically 
to some of the the COVID vaccine ambassador work that we've just building up. We actually just over this last month have um, have been um, meeting with a few key leaders, and I'm sorry, I'm blanking on his name um, in terms of the group that he represents. Um, but we it's it's been a really great opportunity to just kind of get some feedback on our on our literature that we can put together in Spanish, like providing Spanish consent forms, as well as just, you know, thinking about like how to how to kind of get the word out and from a trusted partner. So um, it's been it's been smaller in Broomfield County historically. So I would say, you know, I, I've been with the county for a very long time, but this is a very exciting time to see that we've got so much momentum. Um, and I think that this will help us with just other health priorities as well. Mental health is, as we've talked about on our various board meetings, really important too. Um, but this, is, so it's growing and, and we we definitely would always take other connections and partners. If you're, if you're somebody you wanted to recommend to us, we'd be happy to add them to our, our the meetings that we've started up because um, they're kind of varying, you know, bi-weekly, you know, once once a month, the different meetings that we're kind of building um, these partnerships with. There's there's one one person whose name is Fernando Pineda, and I believe. Oh yeah, he's on our, he's on our group already. <laughs> yep, Fernando's great. Um, yep, and he's he's well well connected and has a lot of great ideas. Hey, um, I, I just had a clarification for sports and for um, intra district intra district competition. Are there um, testing or screening requirements around athletics that are unique, or is that also all voluntary? Um, it is all voluntary right now for anything that uh, happens within the school district. Um, as you know, or you probably know, the guidance uh, changes uh, quite frequently, and there's been some changes in our <laughs> organized sports guidance and so I'm not uh, positive about um, uh, when tournaments or different um, games or events happen outside of the district. But within for all of our athletics, it is um, it's um, not required. Okay, because I do notice there are quite a few quarantines at the high school level in athletics. And it, so it seems like we're testing appropriately, um, but I, I don't really know. I just thought I'd ask. I don't know if we have indoor sports this next season, C or D, whatever we're headed into. Uh, we do. We have uh, volleyball, which is uh, inside. Um, we have some football and, and some soccer as well. Uh, we have had, uh, like you said, some pretty large uh, quarantines um, in our athletic groups. Uh, what we have seen predominantly are folks coming from uh, club sports and other activities um, who seem to be contracting the virus in that um, environment and then coming to school practicing. We're not seeing a lot of, uh, again, transmission in our classrooms. We're not seeing really any, um, but sometimes in sports, uh, you know, with the close contact, um, the increased respiration, things like that, we do see more transmission there. Thank you. Um, and just again, a plug for these saliva tests. I was at Whittier today <laughs> and it took, I mean, a minute and a half or something. We're pre-registered. The results will probably be in our inbox tomorrow. It's really easy. So yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, it's really, you guys are doing an amazing job, um, all of you. So I really appreciate it. Um, with that, I think we might be done with the COVID portion of the superintendent's report. Maybe all the report. I don't know. <laughs> yes, that concludes the superintendent's report. It does. Okay, great. So our next item is the district accountability committee report. And always, um, we extend our thanks. Bye. Um, we extend our thanks to the district accountability committee that's comprised of parents from across our district that are engaged with their school accountability committees. And we also appreciate all of their work during what was a really, and it continues to be a really stressful year. And so we appreciate volunteering and stepping up to continue to fulfill your role of looking at the uh, unified improvement plan and um, making sure that we do have accountability around the stated outcomes that our district is seeking to achieve. So um, thank you to Nicole and John and Ralph 
And uh, oops, I'm missing someone who is here, not seeing the fourth. Um, and so if you want to go ahead and uh, give us your report, that would be great. Um, thanks, uh, Board President Marquis and Dr. Edison, members of the board for having us here tonight. Um, and so Jorge, Jorge Chavez, the other board um, executive member on DAC will be presenting with me and we have Ralph and John here to help with questions. So one of the big tasks of the District Accountability Committee um, is to look at, and this is defined by state statute, look at the school's unified improvement plan, both in its creation and then checking in on it quarterly um, throughout the academic year to see if it's on track. And um, we received this year's report back in on February 20th, and we were able to turn around uh, a quick a quick summary of recommendations and thoughts on that plan for you all here tonight. Um, and we're going to try to be really brief because I know you have a long meeting ahead and um, Jonathan Dings is going to do a, a very thorough job of explaining the UIP later in the evening. So um, looking at this plan, we really use the CDE's rubric for district um, their quality criteria rubric for unified improvement plans as our guide. And we made some very broad recommendations that we kind of saw things popping up consistently throughout the plan and some specific ones. So the broad recommendations are the earlier we can get this, the better. Um, these are two-year plans. And um, to be thorough, particularly in that first year and executing the plan and checking in on it, the sooner we can get the plan, the better. I know this year has not been easy. Um, and I can see how this plan maybe wasn't a priority um, to put together all 36 pages tidily back in September. Um, but that being said, moving forward, that would be greatly appreciated um, for both our school accountability committees and the DAC. Um, we also want to mention that this is probably one of the better plans we have seen in a really long time. I think the district has done a really great job of laying out um, priority performance challenges and root causes, and they have included um, action steps and implementation benchmarks for each of those this year. So I think a thorough job um, has been done overall and wanted to commend the district on including all those really important components. A couple areas of um, improvement that we saw, we noted, um, was there have been lots of constituents and, and groups that have been involved in kind of thinking about the strategic plan and um, components of that. And a lot of those components have been carried through the UIP as well, um, which is excellent. And so, but not all those groups really got, um, were, were noted as being a part of the, the development of this plan. That's something that CDE calls for, like, did you consult the DACs? Did you consult SACs? And I know the Latino Parent Council um, was involved in some of the strategic plan dialogue as well. So if the district could, um, kind of loop in some of those other groups that were consulted in parts of this plan, um, and then really explicitly call out how the DAC and the SACs um, can be involved in sort of that quarterly review process a little bit more clearly for some of their implementation benchmarks. So checking in to see, to see as being part of the people that check in to see um, on specific areas of the plan um, is something that we thought was an area improvement as well. Other areas of improvement um, that we noted were really clearly making sure that all of the root causes identified um, and major improvement strategies had specific implementation benchmarks and action steps associated with them. The draft plan that we saw, um, while um, at least one of the root causes with any PPC, Priority Performance Challenge, had those, but not all of them did, and not all of them were clearly anchored in things that we, that were, um, evident to the DAC were, that were easily measurable. And therefore, um, when they're not re really clear on how it's going to measure, it makes it challenging for the DAC to follow up on those quarterly to see how, um, how the plan is pro progressing along and whether the root causes have been appropriately identified for any of those problems. So those are some of the overarching um, themes that we or points of improvement and then points of success that we had noticed in the plan, the draft plan that we received. And from there, I'm gonna hand it over to um, Jorge Chavez, who's gonna talk about a few of the specific recommendations that the district accountability came up with. Thank you, Nicole. Um, let me start off by kind of reiterating a point that Nicole made that we um, 
Thank you to Jonathan Diggs and the district for the work they put into the UIP plan this year. It, it's clear that a lot of work went into it and that it was very thoughtful in terms of their approach in, um, in addressing a, a number of issues that they see in, in the data. Um, and thank you to the board for the chance to kind of provide our feedback um, and our thoughts on it. I'm gonna to touch just on a couple of highlights for some of our specific recommendations regarding some of the priority performance challenges. Um, starting with the priority, priority performance challenge on inequitable discipline, um, the UIP identifies two root causes, um, data collection and promoting positive behaviors. And, and that's a great start, but clearly that, you know, it's only a part of the, a part of the issue here. Um, but more importantly, uh, the majority of benchmarks in the UIP are focused on data collection and review. Um, and there is no explicit focus on positive behavioral interventions or restorative justice as major improvement strategies. Um, and this should be an integral part of the UIP. Um, regarding the priority performance challenge uh, achievement and growth gaps, um, rightfully so, the district identifies the, the high risk that these gaps are widening over the course of the pandemic in this past year, given remote learning um, and the collateral issues with the pandemic. Um, however, um, this results in the UIP largely ignoring the kind of longstanding chronic existing gaps in disparities in opportunities and achievement um, across racial ethnic groups and social class in the district. Um, and so we feel that there's a need to include clear measurable action steps and implementation benchmarks that address these kind of longstanding gaps um, in terms of, of, of delivery and opportunity for students. Um, regarding the priority performance challenge on large disparities in academic acceleration, um, it, it is not clear how the action plans and implementation benchmarks um, will achieve the intended results of equitable academic opportunities. Um, in, in particular, while they note a lack of clear consistent acceleration paths um, being a part of the problem, the only paths that are actually identified in the UIP are those focused on mathematics and not in other areas. So, so this needs to be addressed. Um, and if this, uh, if addressing this is going to be evidence-based, then we really need baseline data um, regarding enrollment in and access to accelerated courses, as well as more data on baselines for trends and performance targets for gifted students um, across the UIP. Um, we can't measure change without including baseline data in terms of where we are now to see kind of where we're going. Um, and, and so those are just kind of some of the specific recommendations that the DAC had regarding the, um, the UIP. Thank you. And I'll add, I know um, the district is really moving towards having more local um, local data available. Um, and so, um, metrics are not necessarily just focused on um, achievement and growth scores. And so I know that that's a work in progress and that might be part of the reason why some of the, the data the DAC always asks for is not really available for, available for this plan. Um, but I think this year, and we noted this in our memo too, that this year more than ever has highlighted the need to continue to work on local sources of um, data for our for our district um, without having state testing in 2020 and having that be our main source of previous um, data that was that's really left um, it's made things I think interesting, particularly from the DAC perspective. With that, do you guys have any questions for us at all? Sure. Um, board members, who wants to ask a question? Uh, knowing that we'll also be going over some of this with Jonathan later. Donna, I saw your hand up. Yeah, a couple of questions I had as I read the, the memo, and, and I do appreciate your work. You guys have done a, a great job. Um, one of the steps, and I know as teaching for many, many decades and being in the district, we as teachers, we, we always, uh, and especially the teachers I helped develop those uh, plans, <laughs> the individual education plans, IEPs, we, we do start with baseline data and we do try very hard to see wh where we started, where we're going, have we made progress, do we need to change the strategy? But one of the concerns I had as I read the memo, and, and maybe I totally misunderstood, sorry, my phone's going off, but um, on the inequitable discipline, uh, generally in, in business, in, in teaching pedagogy, and in, in everything, you start with a problem statement. And after that problem statement, you m move on to the root cause and then the corrective actions. And, and that one just kind of struck me as the inequitable discipline, the two root causes, and they were data collection and promoting positive behaviors. To me, those seem to be uh, corrective actions rather than a root cause. I, I've talked to other teachers, administrators, and, and also people in the community as, as far as what they think the root cause is, but 
but but I'm wondering if anybody could expand on that because I may have totally misread it and maybe other people would too on, on that bullet point under the PPC. Okay, is this a, a, the best question for Dak or for Jonathan? I guess. Well, he may answer it. He he may answer it. I'm just saying because since Dak sent out the memo and and yeah. that's what it, it it had on it, there might be some clarification that other people might be able to have before Jonathan's um, yeah. uh, expose. <laughs> yes. So Dak, let me know what. Uh, th thank you, Don. I think that's a really important question, right? How do we identify what the root causes are? Um, and, and so, and I think that's kind of part of what was driving our recommendation here, really, that, you know, the data, while a useful tool, isn't enough. That shows us potentially what the problems are, but not necessarily the explanations. But clearly, having better data and more systematic data across the district is an important component of this. In, in terms of addressing the root causes, right, what we do know is that it's starting, um, what we talked um, last semester, I guess, part of the SRO review was that the problems are starting in the classrooms with the teachers um, at these specific schools. And we have to really understand kind of what's going on there. And part of it could be addressing better responses to students when there's problem behaviors. And, and part of it could be addressing the social emotional development of students. Um, so I think there's potential for us to um, move on towards other avenues. And I think this is a starting point, but I, I think there's more work that needs to be done here. And that's just, you know, from my perspective. And I would add that some of this work started last year in the, with the um, change in the discipline policy. And because that was prior to this plan, it makes sense that that wouldn't really be included in that. But changing that policy that really did some change in practice um, has started to occur before this plan was drafted. Um, so may not that it likely is not well captured in here. Right, Rob. Thank, you. Thank you. That might that might uh, clarify some of the. Uh, the questions I had in the difference between root causes versus corrective action. Thank you. Rob? Donna, those are great questions. You're going to hear about this a couple times. You'll hear about this from Jonathan um, in regards to why did we take these steps first. Also, um, as, we, as we provide the update on the resolution um, that was passed 2033, you'll be hearing an update on some of the, some of the action steps and things that we've done um, um, over the course of the past year in regards to discipline and disproportionate discipline. You know, just as a reminder to the board and to the public, um, when we started to really dig into this, schools were creating their own codes. Nobody was entering. There wasn't an expectation on entering the data, right? So while the root cause may be, may, may be, may be deeper, certainly, you know, you can't really be, begin to establish baseline until you get everybody on the same page. And I, so I think that um, but Jonathan will get into that a little bit more, and then we'll talk to um, speak to uh, to you all in a little bit more depth as we present um, our information item 7.1 this evening. Great, um, Lisa, put your hand up. Thank you. Um, I had a question for Rob. I'm, could you explain to me a little bit about what the district does with these recommendations from DAC? when or how do we incorporate them and when do you circle back to DAC to talk more about it or, or what happens with this information? Uh, Jonathan will speak to uh, that more in detail. We do, we do consider this information as we begin to develop our draft plan and believe some of this information was incorporated into the presentation that you'll see this evening. Um, we'll have, uh, um, we, we, we've had this information for, um, is it about a week, Nicole, if we had it for about a week? And so we have made some adjustments. So when we get to the second part here with Jonathan, we'll have a clear picture of, of which of these recommendations were sort of brought back into the proposal and which things were not. Okay, thanks. No questions for Dak, just thanks so much for your hard work. Uh, Richard, Stacy, Kathy, Kitty? Uh, okay. I, uh, I Richard. Just want, I just wanna say that I really appreciate Donna's question in terms of the root causes. And uh, I'm hoping that more discussion can go around those particular root causes because I have feelings, I have suspicions, I have a bunch of things. And uh, I think it just raises a lot of questions in terms of what is really going on. Uh, so I appreciate your question, Donna. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and for DAC, I really appreciate the work you're doing. I, I think your, your recommendations in terms of PPCs 
for me, raised a lot more questions then, but I'm anxious to hear what, what uh, 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 our, our evaluation guru is going to let us know about. Uh, but, uh, but thank you so much. Kathy? So this, um, Rob, might be a question for Jonathan, but on the second bullet on PPC, it talks about the chronic nature of disparity and opportunity and achievement, which of course jumped out at me. But then the next sentence is just focused on inconsistent instructional delivery. So I didn't know if the um, nature of the disparity was limited to instructional delivery or if it was broader than that. So that might not be something for DAC to answer, but it kind of jumped out at me as to are we looking at a broader issue with the disparity in opportunities or is it just limited to that in this report? Uh, yeah, Don, Jonathan, I do believe we'll, we'll cover that. But, and if not, then we can kind of dig into that more um, once he presents. And I don't know if anyone from DAC wants to answer that, but it seemed like a pretty specific question. I didn't want to put anyone on the spot for that. But obviously the questions about disparity and opportunity are a concern. So we'll leave it up to Jonathan. Okay. Well, I'm glad our questions are, are generating questions of for, that, that you're coming up with to ask Jonathan later in the evening. That's a positive. Well, and, and I'll echo what everyone else has said. You guys have done amazing work on a short turnaround, and we so value your, your contributions and your time. Thank you. I'd like to also comment to Jonathan. You know, we began to feed data to him at a detailed level with questions and, and highlighting information. He began immediately to incorporate things. So the dialogue and the correspondence that's gone between ourselves, the DAC, and, and Jonathan has been really outstanding. Um, yeah, it's really, it's such an interesting process because Lisa asked, what does Rob do with this memo from DAC? But really the memos for the board, the DAC gives recommendations to the board, but there's so much interaction between staff and the DAC before it comes to the board and then after it comes to the board. So it's, it's kind of a, it goes in many different directions. Um, and it's also just a coincidence that we're doing the other report on the um, disparities and dis discipline, disparity and discipline. So it, that's a lot of the same topic. So it's kind of hard to put them in the right order you know, how should we go about that? So it is a little tricky. So hopefully it comes together. And then what we can do is if we find that there are gaps at the end of the evening, we can um, talk about those in the next two presentations or even an agenda setting if there's a major gap that someone identifies through this, this through tonight's board meeting, if that sounds okay with everyone. Um, and yeah, I, I just echo all the hard work you've done. Thank you so much. and. I feel like DAC's UIP recommendations just get better every year and, and more specific and more helpful. And um, so I appreciate it. It's easier when the plan gets better every year to give. When the plan gets more specific, we can give more specific feedback. So I guess th thank you, Jonathan, for making our job easier this year. It's a really good comment. Um, all right. So I think our next item is public participation. All right, so uh, public particip participation, of course, continues to be in a virtual format, but I'm hopeful that that will change soon. And if you had wished to speak at today's meeting, you would have needed to call the board secretary, Laura Schaefer, and sign up by noon today. And then you would have joined our Zoom call and you'd be in our waiting room getting ready to go. Uh, I'll just remind everyone to confine uh, your comments to matters that are germane to the business of the school district. Uh, please limit your presentation to two minutes. You will see a yellow card when you have 30 seconds remaining. There it is. Then when you have 10 seconds, you will see an orange card. Then wrap up your comments. Um, and then a timer will sound at two minutes and your microphone will be muted. One of the interesting things that we're doing in the virtual setting. Um, and that's about it. So our first speaker this evening is um, Dejon, Dejane LaRussi, and I apologize uh, for the mispronunciation, who was given two minutes by Lisa Larson for a total of four minutes. Good evening. I want to start by thanking the board for all your hard work in working with BVSD during this extremely challenging time. My name is Dejanae Ayrusi, and I have been a paraeducator in the district since 
2012, and I am also the vice president of the Boulder Valley Paraeducators Association. There have been many decisions I have made in my lifetime, but one of the best life decisions I have made was coming to work for BVSD. It has been a great honor and privilege to be able to have an amazing relationship. Okay, um, is this breaking out for other people a little bit? Okay. Are you able to hear me now? Yes. Okay. I'll start over. Um, good evening. I wanted to thank you um, for all your hard work. Um, my name is Dejanay Iruthi, and I have been a para in the district since 2012. And I'm also the vice president of Boulder Valley Para, Educa para Educators Association. There have been many decisions I have made in my lifetime, but one of the best life decisions I have made was coming to work for BVSD. It has been a great honor and privilege to be able to form the amazing relationships I have with my colleagues, the families I work with, and most of all, the students. I am sure that my fellow paraeducators would agree that one of the most rewarding parts of our job is watching the students that you have been working with have that aha moment where everything you have spent countless hours trying to teach and explain in every possible way has paid off. Unfortunately, many of those blessings and rewards come at a great sacrifice. Paras in this district have a starting wage of just $12.83 an hour. This has forced many of us to have to go out and get a second and sometimes even a third job in order to support ourselves, our families, and to manage our households. We spend the majority of our day supporting and connecting with other family students, watching and helping them grow and building lifelong connections with them, but have to leave that job to head to another, neglecting and missing out on the lives of our own children and students just to be able to make ends meet. Prior to and during this pandemic, paraeducators are always on the, on the front line. Paras have been in person for most, if not all, of this school year, while others were not given the ultimatum to do so. And many have been working in dangerous health conditions with students that are not capable of wearing a mask or social distance. The work we do is invaluable. If you were to ask any teacher that has had the privilege of working with a para, Many of them would say that they wouldn't know how to meet the needs of every student in the room without the help and much needed support that a paraeducator brings. We love what we do, and we would love to see our worth printed on the pay stubs we receive on a monthly basis. Even those with many years in the district are working at or below the poverty line in a community that has the highest rent and property values in the metro area. As a consequence, most paraeducators are at their breaking point, feeling that their tireless work um, is going unnoticed and that they are just another warm body in the building, expendable. In lieu of this, we are asking that paraeducators be thought of and compensated for being valuable assets to the students that we work with the buildings that we work in, and to the district that employs us. We should be paid at a minimum of $15 an hour. This increase reflects the crucial work we do for BVSD. It is deserving of each and every one of us and our families. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, our next um, speaker is Jim Neville. Jim, are you there? I am there. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for the uh, muted portion there. Uh, good evening, Dr. Anderson and members of the board and guests. Uh, thank you for your resiliency during this COVID period. You guys show lots of courage. Well, my name is Jim Neville and I work in the transportation as a bus driver. And I am here to ask you to consider renaming the transportation center, the Janet Williams Transportation Center. Uh, there are times in our lives when we have the privilege of interacting with individuals who make us better people. These type of people are rare, but they, they mark our lives. Janet Williams is one of these people for the transportation department. Her part in transportation is she's the lead dispatch. Dispatch is that interface between concerned parents, garage mechanics, hundreds of drivers, and maybe 
40 or 50 aides. They provide knowledge, uh, these dispatch provide knowledge to thousands of uh, bus stops and uh, many thousands of students. Well, in Janet's case, she is the benchmark of excellence in, in customer service to parents. She manages all the bus drivers with professionalism and grace. This is not to mention dispatching mechanics, pulling and handling broken down buses and finding the occasional misdirected student. But her real import is how she handles herself. It's her demeanor. Uh, that demeanor is a public presentation uh, of the staff uh, to the staff and parents. It's her patience, her kindness that sets the temple for outstanding esprit de corps in the department. And this is not to mention her encyclopedic knowledge of transportation that never ceases to amaze all. She is the public face of excellence in the transportation department. Currently, she is struggling with a second bout of cancer. The disease is running its course and she has a short time to live. And she's beloved by all, this is an understatement. Heaven will be a better place when she arrives. Hence, I'd like to request that you rename the Boulder Terminal the Janet Williams Transportation Center. So thank you for considering this request. Okay, our next speaker is Carol Calicut Bellman. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you, board, for letting us have this chance to speak. I'm the parent of two BVS Day D students and the co-lead for East Boulder County Moms Demand Action. I'm here to ask the school board to pass a safe storage resolution and to approve of the distribution of educational material on safe storage of weapons. The DPS school board adopted a safe storage resolution in 2020 and distributed educational materials to every parent in the district. They now include this information in their handbook and require parents to acknowledge in writing that they have read it. Similar resolutions have been passed by several school districts around the country. We recently had a tragic unintentional shooting death in our BVSD community that would not have happened if the gun used had been safely stored. A few weeks before that, a young teenager in my community of Louisville took an unsecured and loaded weapon, loaded gun from his home to the skate park where he fired the weapon. This same student was expelled from the school my children attend approximately two years ago when he threatened to bring a gun to school. That this child known to have threatened violence by gun was living in a home with an unsecured and loaded weapon that he was able to access with such ease sends chills down my spine. A safe storage bill is currently moving through the Colorado State Legislature that requires the Department of Public Health to develop, develop and implement a firearm storage education campaign. We have a PTA endorsed program called Be Smart that advocates for storing guns unloaded and locked and locking up ammunition separately. It also offers simple guidelines to start conversations between parents for playdates, family get togethers, et cetera. I would love to help BVSD distribute these materials to every parent in the district. Gun violence is the number one cause of death for children in the US and in Colorado. Youth suicides and unintentional shootings in Colorado are on, are on the rise. We don't have the luxury of ignoring this public health crisis. BVSD has a vital role to play in the education of our communities and in protecting our children. Okay, uh, Lisa Hall. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Good evening. I'd like to bring some troubling dynamics to the community and the board's attention. Last month, a parent who is also a district accountability representative obtained emails through a CORA request that are very concerning. The emails show that DAC co-chairs Nicole Rajpal and Ralph Frid were communicating with board members and Dr. Anderson to manage some of the DAC representatives who have been labeled troublemakers behind their backs. My name, along with others, were specifically mentioned in this negative and disparaging way to district administration without our knowledge. There appears to be a coordination between DAC and district leadership to work against these parents' concerns and align to silence them. This undermines the role of the DAC. It should also be noted that Nicole Rajpal may be running for an open board of education seat. Her communications call into question the motives of those leading the DAC. Is it to represent parents and schools' concerns with the goal of district accountability or for personal political gain? Over the last two weeks, this named group of parents have attempted to work through this with DAC and district leadership. Multiple emails to Nicole, Ralph, Tina Marquise, and Dr. Anderson requesting an apology and meeting have gone unanswered. It is unprofessional, unacceptable, and not beneficial to the district. 
Parents are trying to advocate for their school accountability committee's concerns and their collective concerns, like students' mental health, our COVID response, parent engagement, and are being disregarded and ignored. We may not always agree and need a good working relationship, but this dysfunction is not in line with bylaws and mission of the DAC and district relationship, nor does it serve our kids in schools. Parents in the community need to believe that the SACs and DAC are working in good faith to address their concerns. Following public comment, I'm asking for a public apology for the disparagement of this group of parents and a meeting to work through this in men's fences. This is in the best interest of the DAC, district administration, and every BVSD student. Okay, our next speaker is Peggy Dara. Peggy, are you there? Is Peggy in the waiting room? She was in the waiting room. I needed to promote her to panelists. Oh, I see and her. And I think she's good now. I'm gonna ask her to unmute. Peggy, you are muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Peggy Dara, as you guys know. <laughs> I'm the mother of two BBSD students, the PTA president for Ryan Elementary and a co-lead for East Boulder County's Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I decided early on in my parenting career that the only way to raise my kids was to get involved, raise money for schools, coach rec sports, and most importantly, educate the community on storing guns securely, especially for juveniles. Last month, a 14-year-old boy from Lafayette lost his life from an unintentional shooting. His friend accidentally pulled the trigger on the boy's own gun. This preventable shooting happened in my small community. I can't help but think that I should have done more to educate the people of Lafayette and the importance of gun storage or safe storage of firearms. Every year, nearly 350 children under the age of 18 gain access to a firearm and unintentionally shoot themselves or someone else, and hundreds more die from gun suicide, most using guns that belong to a family member. More than 4 million U.S. children live in a household with at least one loaded gun unsecured. Unauthorized access to guns presents a serious safety risk in Colorado's families. A beloved Lafayette boy is dead, and another boy not only accidentally killed his friend, but is being charged for manslaughter because adults allowed kids to have access to guns. Colorado's Safe Storage of Firearms Bill recently passed the committee. This bill includes a safe storage education campaign to educate the public. By disseminating and promoting safe storage information, BVSD can help to save our kids from unintentional shootings, suicides, and God forbid, school shooting. The time to act is now. Thank you for listening. Okay, so thank you. That's the end of public participation. Our next item is board communication. And board members, is everyone okay just to keep going? Great. Uh, Richard, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I, I really don't have anything to say except that I want to thank the people that came and spoke on behalf of the many issues that they raised and uh, uh, just to thank them. and. Uh, uh, nothing else. All right, uh, Kathy. I'll, I'll join Richard in thanking everyone for stepping forward. We have a, an ability to take a position as a board on matters that come in front of the legislature. And I think um, we will have an opportunity to discuss the, the firearm storage. It's hopefully in a, in a soon, in a way that's soon. And I would encourage the, um, the moms to also reach out to like organizations like the Colorado Association of School Boards. It also takes positions on, on legislation so that you can um, try to get additional voices at the Capitol to support your effort. Um, I thought it was a very moving tribute by Mr. Neville for Janet Williams. That was, um, that was very nice of you to do. And, and it's always nice to hear of the great work that our employees are doing. And for you to step up and make that tribute was very nice. So I just wanna say thank you for that. And, and um, for Dejeuner, we know that the para, the paras are 
part of the lifeblood of our system. And so we really appreciate you stepping up and, and talking about that and, and advocating for your for your colleagues. So thank you very much, everyone, for stepping up. Um, really appreciate it. And we'll look forward to continuing to work together. OK, Donna? Yeah, I want to thank the um, Dejeuner, I guess, for uh, I love that name, by the way, for, um, you know, just reiterating what, what we've said and or I have always said, because most of my profession was with working with uh, peer educators in our um, uh, transition team and at Boulder Community Hospital and couldn't have done the job without you guys. So I, I really appreciate you uh, letting us reminding us of uh, that, you know that that you're critical to the um, the growth of our students, um, and I hope we can help um, meet some of the uh, the things that you're asking for. Also, with um, Jim, yeah, thank you. What a great way to honor one of our employees and um, a nice tribute to Janet, um, to Carol and Peggy, near and dear to my heart. I. Uh, I've shared this before, and it's really hard for me to hear. Um, I know I, I, I've taken several gun safety classes with uh, all of my boys that were in scouts, and we had to go through a whole lot of uh, gun safety training, and, and storing of, of weapons is just a critical issue. And, and within my own family, there's been uh, a death by way of a gun. And it, 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 it kills me to hear, to hear the, the things that happen in our community with uh, weapons that aren't kept and stored safely. And to Lisa, I wanna say, I, I, I'm, I want uh, those parents that feel that they were, um, uh, that they feel, and, and that they, that, that possibly they were, um, disparaged through a group they I, I hear you on needing an apology and and I, I think that parents need the communication from not only board members from district members from DAC members we all need to work together um, not just in creating safety but in creating uh, transparency and, um, and and good communication we don't all have to agree but but we have to be uh, just kind to each other. And uh, I often make mugs in my retirement position on uh, just be kind. And, and and I think that there's ways that we can do that without hurting each other. And um, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Hey, okay, Kitty. Um, yes, I want to join everybody else in thanking everyone who came to speak. Um, I was particularly moved like the rest of us with the tribute to Janet. And I have no idea what our policy is on naming buildings, but um, it was a good suggestion and thank you for bringing it forward. Um, in terms of gun safety, I have been a strong proponent of that for a long time. And I think it's crucial that everybody who has a gun has it stored in such a way that is, that people who are not authorized, and especially children, cannot get access to it because the, the um, ramifications can be tragic, like we saw in Lafayette. And, oh, the um, paraeducators, yeah. I, I appreciate all you do. I understand, you know, you're uh, the kind of the crutch for the teachers who, um, need the help that you provide and I'm hoping we can do better by you and what else did I miss the yes and for Lisa um, I am sorry that this happened to you I uh, you know I don't know what to say other than that but I agree that nobody should be disparaged and then the other thing is I was also able to listen in on the sustainability um, meeting and it was really interesting. You know, I didn't participate at all, but it was interesting to hear. Okay, Lisa. Going at the end of this always feels a, a little like a, an echo, but um, yes, again, paraeducators, I, I appreciated the information um, there and uh, the, the Janet Williams tribute was very touching. Um, you know, 
Tina, you and I have spoken a few times in the last year about this, this gun storage issue. I, I don't know if we're allowed to ask questions now, but I'm not clear if we need to bring, okay, some of you I'll just make as a statement. I don't know if we need to bring this up in agenda setting later or if it's something that's already coming up, but I hope we can figure that out and find a way to have that conversation in more depth. Okay, Stacy. I don't have anything that's already, that hasn't already been said, so thanks. All right, um, and I'll just add, uh, I just wanted to thank all the people that came today to the um, board candidate interest meeting. So we had a great turnout and I'm, I'm glad the board members were able to show up and share their experiences so far on the board. We have another session coming up on March 29th at 6.30 p.m. So do um, connect with Laura Schaefer if you're interested. Also, if you can't attend, that's of course not a barrier. Laura can uh, send you all the information about the deadlines, what the process is, what the role is. Um, and you can also connect with any of the board members to find out about how to run or what their experience is with the role. Um, we also did start our negotiations in the last couple of weeks. And it is a really interesting time when we consider where we're going to invest and, and what we, you know, which employee groups can we help with their salaries, with their benefits and their compensation. Um, we have a lot of competing interests and prioritization of the budget is one of the hardest things a board member does. We have so many employees who are doing such important work for every one of our students. So that's what makes it so challenging. We just don't have the funds to pay them what they are worth. And um, they're worth a lot, all of our employees are. So, um, and that's important. And I um, do hope that, um, that I do appreciate the, the notice about uh, Janet Williams and I hope that um, she's managing her illness. My heart goes out to her and her family. Um, and then, and lastly, in terms of DAC and, and actually with just board communications, we've had some talk about codes of civility and um, I've certainly received some pretty horrible emails this year and uh, generally working on communication with all of our volunteers on how it can be respectful and kind. Um, and I think that's important both from a board perspective and for all of the volunteers that have um, graciously given their time to the district. Um, so with that, our next item is an information item. And we are looking at the much awaited uh, culturally Responsive Disciplinary Planning and Board Resolution 2033 Update. So I think Kathleen is going to be helping us out with this, and Rob. Tina, can we take a break after this presentation? Yeah. Okay. Uh, board President Marquis, uh, board members, uh, yes, a very highly um, anticipated uh, presentation for you all today. Um, as as stated in Board Resolution 2033, we committed to providing you quarterly updates in regards to the progress that we were making, have been making um, in fulfilling um, what it is uh, that you have requested from staff in this resolution. And so um, we have Kathleen Sullivan and Brennan Sullivan uh, that will be presenting today. Um, and at this point, Kathleen, I believe I'm turning the presentation over to you. Good evening, President Marquis, members of the board. Um, may I say a special thank you to Randy Barber as we get started for running the slides today. I don't have to do both. Um, so we are here tonight to report progress on the work that has been happening with culturally responsive discipline. And we had a great lead in with the discussion in the UIP already, so we can dive right in. Randy, with the next slide, please. So the purpose of tonight's presentation is really to share progress that we've made in fixing systems that support equitable discipline. Dr. Anderson referenced those um, a little bit earlier and we'll be sure to touch on those. So the first part of this presentation will address equitable discipline, work on data systems and outline the next steps in this work. You will see that it is the strategic plan and the board's resolution 2033 that provide the foundation for this work. And then Brendan Sullivan will focus on the work that is being done in school safety. Next slide. 
So this timeline, I understand, is small. We did provide it to you um, in Board Docs so that you can review the whole thing in detail. At the top, you will see this timeline really began with this board's work to adopt revised discipline policies in June um, of 2020. We have focused this school year, these items in the dark blue boxes at the top left, um, really making sure that we looked at the discipline system, that we developed policies and procedures and definitions and structures that are common across our system to make sure that we have a transparent conduct and discipline data system that yields reliable information. Um, as you proceed down those blue boxes on the left, you will see that now we are moving into this phase of focus on expanding the use of alternatives to exclusionary discipline, restorative justice, and connecting to the work that will continue in the strategic plan, Initiative 2A, to develop a consistent system of supports for students across the district. So the early part of these lines at top left is the work we've done this year and then now connecting to where we will be heading. Next slide, Randy, thanks. So this is um, an update that's been provided to the board before. Bullying was a major issue that our community brought forward and that we needed to address when we revised the discipline policies. We did adopt a specific policy on bullying along with a regulation that outlines the expectations for interventions that will be put in place as well as a board policy exhibit that lays out a full uh, expectation of report, investigations and reporting. We also are amazing team of uh, directors of student services and supports have put together professional development on bullying prevention. You can see on this slide, there was a tremendous amount of training done on that this year. Both before school started at the beginning of the year and then ongoing professional development in this area. They also built out a curricular scope and sequence on bullying prevention that's been implemented in this very interesting and challenging school year. So um, the other work that we've done really specific to the equitable discipline and the data system. So I already mentioned the, the revised board policies. As Dr. Anderson mentioned, um, prior to this school year, schools in Boulder Valley had different discipline codes and student codes of conduct by building. So we had some centralized pieces, but there was a lot of independent work being done at the school level, which makes it hard to compare data. So we began by changing our student information system, so infinite campus and the way that we define and describe student conduct. So we replaced this uh, wide scatter of different ways to describe student conduct with the categories and definitions that are used by the Colorado Department of Education and the Office for Civil Rights. And we changed all of our systems to make sure that those were the only definitions that our staff were using. We also enhanced the capacity that we had previously to use the district Tableau system, we call it VizLab, so that we can uh, display and manipulate this data differently. Remember Garcia, you may remember last year when you asked for some discipline data that it took a significant amount of work to generate that data and some time to provide it to you. We now have a system where we can disaggregate data on the basis of race, gender, disability, free and reduced lunch, and many of the other um, categories and factors that we really need to be able to look at to get down to root cause and making sure that we've got good reliable data that we can analyze and used to drive future change. As well as then changing the definitions and our codes and our ability to analyze that data, we developed additional artifacts to support buildings 
to align our responses. One of those key documents is the discipline matrix. The matrix identifies all of these different categories of student conduct, and then the sorts of interventions that are appropriate as that conduct appears in schools. The focus is really making sure that our, te our team and our school leaders are looking at the full range of possible responses to student behavior so that we are uh, exploring all of the other responses we can use prior to exclusionary discipline of suspension or expulsion. That matrix and these artifacts that I'm mentioning are what allow us to make sure we're getting our system aligned. Good anticipation, Randy. Ready for the next one. So our ongoing work, what you see here, the picture on this slide is Brendan Sullivan, Rick Kellogg, Jesse Lunsford, and myself in our monthly meeting that we have. We call this well, we called it the Vortex Boot Camp when we started the school year. Vortex really references all this important student conduct, discipline, and safety related information. So our focus was on how do we create this information? How do we make sure the right people have it? And how do we make sure that people across all of our buildings um, understand how the system works and are able to um, to connect with colleagues and supports to make sure that they are responding in an equitable way. So we started this at the beginning of the school year. We had more than 140 people. We spent a full day together. We asked for two representatives from each school. In that full day, we touched on bullying, Title IX, which is really sexual harassment, student conduct, threat assessments, suicide risk reviews, um, to really make sure that we had a good grounding up front. As the school year's gone on, we meet on a monthly basis. We meet the first Thursday of every month, and we focus in on specific problems of practice. So we talk through hypotheticals and real life situations. What happened? What did you do? How did you categorize this conduct? And what was the response that was put in place? so we can increase alignment across our system. We also, every time we meet that Thursday, we have one of our data specialists, Claire Sims, who joins us. She works through quality issues that we are identifying in the data on a monthly basis so that we can correct those. We can make sure we've got all of the components of an incident entered so that we've got good data when we go to analyze it. Um, so she spends time with those teams every month. The point being, we want to make sure our building leaders have the capacity to look at their student conduct and discipline data to identify where there are disproportionalities or where there are other problems that you can identify from that, and then be able to start to create a response at their school level. Um, as this year proceeds, we are going to continue our work really moving, as you'll see on the timeline, if you go back to that slide, to expanding the other responses we have to student conduct. So thanks, Randy. So that fourth box down, expanding the use of alternatives to exclusionary discipline, training on implicit bias and restorative practices. And then if you can jump all the way back. Thank you so much. Um, so our focus now, creating a toolbox of alternatives used in schools, making sure that we are expanding the use, providing professional learning on effective classroom management, implicit bias, culturally responsive practices, and then increasing the use of restorative practices to address student behavior. One of the ways that we're doing that now we know that New Vista High School has a team that is trained in restorative justice, and we really wanted to be able to bring that full process to bear in another school that had an incident. And we were able to partner those two schools together to make sure that we were able to implement those restorative practices now while we build that capacity at each of our schools. 
That was a quick summary of a tremendous amount of work that is happening in this district. Um, from safety and security to our area superintendents, and um, an incredible amount of work from our data team and our building leaders. It's been a, a really exciting um, opportunity to work with people who are deeply engaged in figuring out how we have a system that supports equitable and culturally responsive practices. So Brendan Sullivan is now going to take over the next part of this with a focus on school safety. Good evening. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, okay, perfect. Um, so the next few slides, again, my name is Brendan Sullivan. I'm the Director of Safety and Security for BBSD. Um, so the next few slides will uh, look at school safety from different angles. Um, and this first one is, as our SRO program ends in BBSD, we're going to have to provide the resources, the personnel, and the programs to support our schools and our students to keep our environment safe and to ensure that we have the ability to handle impacts that impact school safety. So this process highlights the work that we will accomplish. This includes reviewing our existing recommendations and identifying our specific safety and security gaps that may exist in our schools. We're going to meet with our school administration to understand their needs and through this process we'll provide opportunities for input from the Latino Parent Advisory Council Parents of Color Council, DAC, the Safe Schools Coalition, and our Youth Equity Council. This process will also, provide, will also provide our schools guidance on how and when we will engage with law enforcement in the future. And then once these recommendations are identified, they will be incorporated into budget proposals and implemented after approval. Next slide, Randy. Uh, this information relates to updating our district emergency operations plans, which keeps the BBSD in alignment with best practices and allows us to provide the best possible outcome for our staff, our students, and our schools during any type of crisis or disaster event. This includes ensuring that the school response framework, school safety, our readiness and incident management planning that's in Title 22 is addressed. We'll work with our school leadership to update their individual school plans, and those plans are going to outline specific operational practices, roles, and responsibilities within the school. We will also train the new school-based safety teams or specific personnel who are responsible for assuming those key incident command positions and interfacing with community partners during a crisis. Next slide, Randy. Um, we will work with our local law enforcement on the development of memorandums of understanding and to the extent possible enter into those agreements, which will specify responsibilities and other mutually accepted expectations, which is also outlined in the school response framework. Um, this timeline allows for the development, draft, addendums, review, and then uh, ultimately approval. Next slide, Randy. Uh, so this last slide uh, deals with our continued partnership for emergency preparedness and response, and this is an ongoing process that doesn't end. Uh, as events unfold in the world that impact school safety or public safety, our uh, new information is always obtained, it's always learned on ways to prevent, prepare, and respond to these types of events. These efforts are going to allow BBSD to stay abreast of current trends and allow us to identify new systems to ensure we're well positioned in a case of some sort of critical incident at our school. Next slide, Randy. I think that's it. We're open for some questions. Okay. Um, thank you so much. And I just want to recognize all the work that's been put into this um, while we're also navigating a pandemic. I made the similar comment at the um, negotiations group. Really, most of our staff are juggling two jobs, at least at this point, as we're trying to keep kids in school while advancing the important strategic initiatives um, that we've all decided are, that we need to do. So I really, really appreciate the work. And um, I also appreciate the incredible energy and positivity that Kathleen exudes when she talks about these policy changes. So it's really... Lovely. Um, so, uh, Richard, would you like to start? Thank you. Thank you, Tina. <clears throat> A lot of work, Kathleen. Wow, you sure, you sure have been busy, you and your team and everybody else working on this thing here. Um, 
you know, I've got some questions that I need to ask, but they're a little bit more in the weed type of questions. So I think I'm going to hold off on that for a little bit. Uh, but I just want to acknowledge that uh, the, the uh, work that you're doing around uh, culturally responsive, I think is excellent. Uh, because when I look at student behavior and student conduct, I, I keep thinking of some of the kids that display student behavior and student conduct that may look a little bit different from other kids and, and, and people in, in, in the past were not taking the cultural differences into account and, and we're probably labeling those particular kids as being uh, defiant of authority or whatever, okay? So I really appreciate uh, the work that you're doing and, and uh, I'm looking at the slides and I'm looking at your dark blue and your light blue slides on the timeline. And a question that I have in terms of the identify and implement programs, resources and personnel to meet school needs and I see that your timeline starts in August of 2021 is, is that correct it, there's a light blue timeline but then the real the darker light blue is in August if you can is that is that about the time that we expect to have a lot of the uh, things that you mentioned uh, completed quick question Um, I think that for a lot of these, we had a ongoing arrow. I'm not sure if you're in the top half or the bottom. Oh, identify. Yep, that question I think is for you, Brendan, about the, oh, go ahead, Rob. I believe the, 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 the item that you're looking at, Richard, is, is really around building the budget proposal, right? So, um, you know, the, the light part of that band is really building the proposal, the dark part of that band, if I understand this correctly, is when those things will be implemented um, um, starting in the 21-22 school year. Brendan, is that is that accurate? Yep, absolutely. And, and this is more in relation to the uh, the safe the safety stuff, right? As opposed to the, re the resource sort of practices, et cetera. So the blue part is the culturally responsive stuff that uh, Kathleen was talking about, and that's ongoing, it seems like. But some of it started now in January 21st. This, this January was started already. So great. So the, the some of the questions that I have is, are, are really uh, uh, very specific type questions that I'll wait and ask later. Okay. Uh, Kathy? I just want to make sure I understand. So this is like the structure and we're going to fill in as we go along am i understanding the presentation so we have like the continue to build upon partnerships and the um, areas that that we heard about is am i understanding this because there's not a lot of detail that i don't think there's supposed to be yet we need to have the structure then to fill in the detail am i understanding that rob you're you're nodding yes yes you know this is our first quarterly update um we have been busy um as as you've seen uh, lots of um, big systemic changes, right, that have taken a ton of bandwidth, a lot of coordination. Um, and uh, again, you know, we, we're working towards this, this, um, this date, uh, you know, got a couple of, I think, key timelines, you know, full implementation by January of 2022, um, right, so that's nine months away, um, you know, with, with the work that Brendan is doing and some of the light blue um, work and, and those timelines that he articulated with you. More details will come on that. I would say that our big focus really has been around this discipline piece, you know, you know, creating better systems for our schools and our people to operate in. And, and I know that you all have heard this, this, this saying, um, if you put good people in bad systems, the systems win. The systems always win, right? So is when you think about big changes that you want to create, and this is a big change and a positive change, um, you work on the systems first, focus on honing in on the systems. And as you've seen, where, where, where the, a lot of this discipline has worked is now we're talking about training, monthly meetings, modeling, you know, um, thought partnering, those types of things. So, uh, but more details, the next quarterly update, Kathy, you, you could expect on those bottom four um, items within that timeline to hear more details on where things are with that. 
And just generally, Rob, it sounds like there's been a lot of meetings with staff and administrators and buildings. How is this being re um, received? Are people favorable? Or is it going? Is it being accepted pretty well? I'm just curious what the reception is out in the community. Well, I mean, I I'd let Kathleen um, or Brendan talk about the, the the meetings. I think that there is incredible energy in our community from my perspective on getting this right. Um, that, um, that, that we've had lots of support in that regard. Um, and I do think that, that, you know, based on that, that our staff is, is eager to learn, understand, and adapt to new systems and expectations. Uh, but Kathleen, I'll let you fill in or Brendan fill in any, any details. Um, these aren't meetings that I'm, I'm particularly attending in person, so. Honestly, it's one of my favorite parts of, of every month because I think we see an incredible amount of engagement. We see people in early and staying present for the whole conversation, which we all know how challenging that is in Zoom. You saw my dog behind me earlier. We're all working around um, a lot of distractions. And we have had a really positive, I would say, overall response from our building leaders. I do think they appreciate the clarity. I know everybody in our district appreciates working with Brendan Sullivan and his team. And we know that really following a really hard week last week. There's a lot of resilience created when you have trusting relationships where you have clear experts who are really accessible and where we have building leaders who are in this in this profession because we want to make the right difference for students and i do think that comes through in this work so one other quick question kathleen what will our metrics be to figure out that all of this work is starting to make a difference do we have we thought about that or um is that still tbd i i will defer oh. Rob? I would defer to Jonathan Dings. I know we'll spend some more time with, with the data, but the biggest marker of how it's working is our discipline should not be disproportionate and we should see kids being excluded less. So really an increased use of non-exclusionary discipline and this data system will give you that because we have very clear codes I lost that are non-exclusionary. Sound. Can you hear her? Oh. Uh, we can hear Kathleen. So I would say that data is going to be able to show you that. You will be able to see how many times schools have put in place a remedy, like a conference with families or an intervention with a counselor or a referral for some other sort of support. Great, thank you. That's amazing work, thank you. And then also, Kathy, on, on April 20th, um, I'm, I'm sorry, in April, we'll be bringing to you, uh, to the board and to the, and to the public, our strategic plan metrics, um, where there is, um, there's, there is a discipline aspect to that, um, that, that will align to these, these quarterly updates as schools are working on their disproportionality and discipline. Um, and, and increase the transparency there. Okay, uh, Donna? Yeah, uh, thanks Kathleen, Brendan, Rob, all, all the hard work that's going into this. And, and I do hear, today I was involved in a conversation, I was kind of the background person, on, on um, a high corporation trying to get satellite production done and trying to get their people that they, they really needed everybody to be on board and working and getting the product out ASAP without a lot of damage and needed to do the damage control. And as I listened to everything going on, it reminded me of the school district and thinking we've got data and we've got plans, but it was real interesting to hear part of this conversation in the corporation because I thought, that's what, that's what we need. And I know you guys have thought of it, but I didn't hear a whole lot of it tonight. But the buy-in and, and one of the problems in this corporation said our, our employees aren't feeling valued. They're asked to do all this extra training, put in all this extra time, change practices, develop new processes. 
uh, go to lots of meetings. And, and that's where we get a lot of resentment. Oh no, my low battery sign came on, but let me try to finish this. Uh, one of the things that, that, that they said is the employees, uh, the people contributing, whether it's going to be teachers, staff, paraeducators, uh, everybody within the district, what, whatever we do to replace SROs has to be on board, but also acknowledged for their their movement towards success. And if they see that they're part of this growth, they're, they're going to have more buy-in. So that, that was just my observation from hearing the talk and how it, how it um, translated or, or at least uh, coincided with what I heard today. And, and I think we, we as a district, we're, we're on board, but there's a lot of changes that are going to have to happen. And the buy-in, not just from the community, but students and staff and teachers. So thanks for letting me just blab on about that. Okay, uh, Kitty. Um, yes, um, Kathleen and Brendan and all who were involved in this, thank you so much for putting in this work. I know it had to be, <clears throat> excuse me, take up a lot of time and effort. I am really delighted to see that we're going to have some uniformity between the schools so that if a student does X, then we know Y is what the response will be. Um, I'm also really delighted about the culturally responsive and also the trauma-informed piece of it. Um, I think that's something that people who haven't um, worked in trauma or really studied it don't understand the impact trauma can have on a student's behavior. And um, a student doesn't have to be, say, assaulted to have experienced trauma. Um, living in poverty can be traumatic and can have the same impact on kids that, you know, experiencing traumatic events does. So I really appreciate this and I look forward to seeing how it gets fleshed out more. But I think you've done a great job of putting together this framework. Okay. Uh, Lisa. Yeah, I, uh, I'm excited about this first update. Thanks for uh, for all the hard work that went in. Rob, um, you know, I, I mentioned this to you before, but I'm really excited about the discipline dashboard. I'm glad we've got that that standing up. I think it'll be really interesting to see what the next year looks like with that and the discipline matrix in conjunction and sort of what information that, that gives us. Uh, the only question I have is around the MOU timeline, which looks like it ends when the next school year starts. And I'm trying to understand when we would be seeing those MOUs. Would we be seeing them when that timeline ends? Or do we anticipate that that would be a staggered process between now and then or, or something different? Yeah, I, I believe, um, and Brennan, you can, you can chime in here if, if, uh, if you'd like. But I do think that you know, we're going to be working with six different municipalities as we start to really think about what do these relationships look like. And I think that we've got to know and understand that some of those um, those uh, those conversations may take a little bit more time than others. And so I think that the timeline reflects kind of a range of time as we start to work through those. Um, but again, I, I don't think that we're waiting. I think that, you know, as Brendan gets moving forward on, on those agreements um, that, uh, and, and some of that is tied to kind of what, what we actually is approved within our budget to, to understand what those MOUs might look like. Uh, but as soon as we have those, um, those, those finalized and connected, then we would be bringing those um, bringing those to you all to share. Uh, Brendan, do you have anything else to add in regards to that? No, I think that's well said. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks so much. Okay, uh, Stacy. I don't have any questions. Just my thanks to Kathleen, Brendan, at all. Um, this is really encouraging, and I look forward to what comes next. Thank you. Yes, I echo what Stacy just said. Thank you for all your work. And I think this is going really well. It's really encouraging. Um, so we had a request for a break. Is everyone okay if we take a break until around 8.25 or something like that? Okay, see you then. Okay, is everyone here and ready to go? Yeah, great. Um, our next item, uh, is the legislative update, and Lisa, I meant to say this in board comment. Well, we can bring up the gun storage there. Um, so uh, by noticing, and Kathleen, let me know if I'm wrong, but we noticed the legislative update 
we don't notice every piece of legislation that may come up because it happens so quickly. So, um, and that's appropriate, right, Kathleen? Yes, that's correct. The agenda just has to have as much detail as possible. And certainly during the session with things changing this quickly, I think that notice is more than adequate. Okay. Um, and one of the, I think I was just caught a little bit by surprise that I thought because of the pandemic, maybe we'd see fewer bills relating to education coming forward, but they are coming fast and hard. And it's pretty interesting. Um, and it's, I even question to some extent whether they should all be coming out given what school boards are dealing with right now. Do we really have the capacity to take on every single one of the bills coming out? Um, so I wanted to talk about a few um, this evening and then would we'll look also to Kathy and Rob. Is, is that okay with everyone or? All right. Um, so one is just an update that the suspension of assessments has now changed for all grades is now suspension of assessments for select grades. So um, it's, a, it's just a recognition that there is going to be some testing, but it limits the amount of testing that's happening. The grades that are included are in the bill, and there seems to be a lot of support for this version of the bill. Um, we recognize that this is still going to have a negative impact on our staff just preparing for the test and making it happen and that the data set we get may not be comparable to other data sets because of the percentage of remote learners we have this year. Um, any questions or thoughts around that bill in its new revised form? I don't know if everyone's watching it or not. I, I would just add a couple of things, Tina. One is uh -huh. that it's an alternating um, assessment schedule, so it's every other year for math and language arts. And parents who want their kids to take all of the assessments are able to opt in, and they just have to let the district know. Um, Kathleen and Rob may know this better than I do, but there's also an assumption that if you're doing remote that you are already opted out, but you can opt in to take it if you want. So, um, And none of the results can be used for any accountability purposes, which I think is really important. So um, we still have to ask the feds for a waiver. We're not doing any science um, or social studies CMAS. And so we have to get a, a waiver from the federal government. But I think people are pretty optimistic that since we will be administering tests that we will get the waiver, but nothing is really you know, settled until we get that official waiver. Did I cover that correctly, Kathleen and Rob, or at least what your understandings are? Yeah, I believe that you did. I, I think that the challenge in this bill that all school districts are struggling with is how quick can can it get through, right? I mean, um, all school districts are really starting to prepare to give the assessments if we have to. I think that, um, that, the, that the timing of this is really, really tough. Uh, literally, we sent out a message, I think, to parents a few weeks ago that created some confusion because, you know, we passed our resolution, we don't want to test, and then in a couple of weeks we said, and we're getting ready to test because we don't really have a choice. Um, you know, if we had a choice, uh, um, then obviously we would have uh, chose to have all testing suspended as our resolution stated. But um, the, the bill is House Bill 21-1161. Um, you know, to your point, math is in three, five, seven, English language arts, four, six, and eight, science, five, five, eight, and 11. Um, and I do believe that there's support for this and, and um, you know, to the extent that we'd be able to get a waiver um, and, and at least get some relief. I think that that would be really great news for us. All right. Um, another bill, and I think Rob, you have some thoughts around this, um, just explaining the total program mill levy tax credit. Do you wanna do that one? Actually, I'm gonna turn it over to Bill. I'd ask Bill to, to prepare just a little bit of an explanation on what this would mean um, for school districts across the, the state and um, here in Boulder Valley. So I'll turn it over to our CFO, Bill Sutter. Uh, thanks, Rob. So the this is a continuation of what was included in last year's School Finance Act uh, that created a uh, mill levy credit uh, for the difference between uh, what districts were levying uh, for the general fund uh, portion of uh, the School Finance Act 
and the mill that uh, was in place when any district um, passed the uh, within the through the ballot process uh, passed what's called debrucing uh, to keep local revenues uh, in excess of inflation and growth. So uh, for Boulder Valley, that difference is uh, a little under two mills. So our current mill levy is uh, 25.023 mills. Uh, and what the state, uh, the, the School Finance Act had put into place was a maximum of uh, 27 mills um, or fully funded. It, it, it's, there's a lot cooked into it. So uh, I'll, I'll skip over some of the parts of, of how, um, when debrucing happened and why districts have all the different mill levy rates. But suffice it to say that what this bill does is uh, puts uh, the, the calculation onto the Department of Education to uh, create a schedule for all districts to get to that maximum mill levy of 27 mills or less if uh, fully funded um, by no more than one mill per year. So what that means is uh, for the 2021 tax year, uh, which is paid in 2022, so the certification, the mill levy certification that will happen in December, uh, the local uh, general fund mill would go from 25.023 to 26.023. Um, there's one district that is 19 mills away from that maximum, so it will take 19 years for this to be fully implemented across the state. Uh, it should be noted that there are also a, a number of districts that are already at 27 mills and have been for a long time. Um, so uh, this implementation of this, there was some question earlier um, around very nuanced language of uh, may versus shall uh, about whether a district uh, had to increase uh, their mill levy. And what this does is take it completely out of the district's hands uh, and requires CDE to correct the mistake that was made. Uh, and I think the language is in the, the bill to, to some extent in that way, uh, correct the mistake that was made and uh, have districts uh, put back to the, the mill that they were at the time of debrucing. Um, this is the best solution, I think, for how uh, this is being implemented at the state level. Um, the uh, This is a House Bill 21-1164 uh, for anybody that's uh, following it. Just on a quick uh, note for the one mil increase on an annual basis, uh, it's about $36 on a $500,000 residential uh, home. Uh, or about $290 on a million dollars uh, worth of non-residential property. Um, so there's just a math problem there between what the value is, the assessment rate, uh, the mill, and the, the uh, annual uh, impact to the taxpayer. Um, I think that about covers it. Uh, so another component of this is this does generate more local dollars which allows the state to reduce through the School Finance Act. As we all know that the legislature uh, passes the School Finance Act, which does impact the funding that we receive. Uh, we do not get to keep additional revenue just because our local collections go up. So uh, if those local dollars are generated across the state, uh, creating additional dollars uh, that, that the state has to work with frees up the dollars at the state level, uh, then the legislature will have to, to enact the distribution of those dollars, uh, whether it's by changing the um, budget stabilization factor or uh, creating a new school finance act. There's certainly been discussion around that, uh, but this absolutely will be a, a, an action of the legislature through the School Finance Act, which will impact our dollars. It's not something that will generate more dollars for us uh, to keep locally. 
Bill, thank you for that clarification because it's so confusing with the two different mill levy applications of that terminology. Some do generate revenue and some don't. Yep. So that's tough. Um, Kathy, Rob, or anyone, do you have any questions or do you want to add anything, Kathy? So, Bill, I don't think there's anything in the statute or the, the bill as it's written that requires them to use any increased money they get for education. Is that true? Uh, I have not seen anything in there uh, specifically for that. So the state could take this increased money that they save by increasing our local property taxes and put it to highways. There's really nothing to stop them other than a loud scream from the education community. Is that fair? Yeah. Which to me is a flaw in the bill, but we'll just have to deal with it next year when the money comes in. I think it's a it's an interesting solution. It's the legislature trying to say we're not raising your taxes, although they're telling CDE and CDE couldn't do it without the legislature telling them to raise the taxes. Um, but if it makes them feel better, you know, I suppose it's okay. Um, and like you said, I think it's really important for people to understand this does not mean we're getting more money into our schools at all, um, locally or from the state. This is just to try to fix a problem to save the state money. And hopefully when they save money, they'll put it back into education, but there's no guarantee. Is that a fair statement? Yeah. And the, the Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court needs to verify that it is okay to do this. Um, so it's, it's rapidly moving in that direction uh, to make it in front of them, but uh, it's, it's not an automatic uh, that it will happen. Yeah, it's something called an interrogatory. So anyway, it's we'll, we'll wait and see. The 27 mills, just so people understand that too, is totally arbitrary. So this is not going to take us anywhere closer to equitable or adequate financing. It's just a, a glitch that's trying to save the state some money. So I, I thought it had a benefit in that it kind of cleaned up the um, taxes so that you could rethink the formula a little bit, that it was a little bit easier as a starting point. Well, I'll let uh, that. it certainly gives it gives the state a little bit more money to work with, um, although it will again take time for it to be fully implemented. Um, so to the extent that they have a little bit more money to work with, it gives them some more flexibility uh, and uh, shores up a little bit of the the disparities in uh, the local property tax. Uh, which are still will be all over the place uh, when it comes to what the mill rate is. Okay. Well, I think we're supporting this as a district um, from the best I can tell. Does anyone have an issue with that? And this is this falls under our legislative platform, just supporting efforts to increase revenues going into public education. That's the, the basic idea. All right. Um, let's see. What else do we have? Uh, I just thought I'd point out that HB 21-1055 is about compensation for school board members. Apparently, that runs similarly. There aren't a lot of sponsors on it. It, it doesn't seem like it would pass necessarily, or, although I asked our lobbyists to see if this year might be any different. Um, but I was interested, Kathy sent me uh, some information that showed that a lot of states do pay their school board members, um, which I have very, very mixed feelings about. And um, so that's something that you all might want to just think about. We certainly do not have it in our legislative platform, and we don't have anything akin to it. Uh, Kitty. Yeah, I have actually strong feelings about this. Perfect. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I can't say for sure what government entities um, pay their elected officials and what don't, but from what I can see, education is always the one that nobody wants to pay for. And I think it, said, it, it makes a statement about what we think about education and how important it is. You know, I live in Superior, very small town. Their town, you know, much, many fewer people than BDSD encompasses, but our trustees get paid. I mean, it's not a salary, but it's a stipend. And I think it's important just to acknowledge that this is an important thing that we do. 
um, education is an important thing and being able to offer a stipend to board members, I think, just helps signify that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the Boulder City Council also added a per diem a few years ago as well, which was interesting uh, too, to your point. Any other thoughts? I don't really know where this is going, so I'm going to go try to find out if um, there, you know, there are some bills that aren't going to go anywhere, so you don't even need to bother weighing in. So I can't tell if this is one of those. So, oh, yeah, Rob? It, it looks like the hearing's on the 11th uh, for this bill. Oh, well, there you go. But also, it would just allow districts to make that decision for themselves. Yeah. We're not telling districts they have to provide a stipend. That's correct. Um, so there are a couple things we could do is we can continue to explore. Um, do other people feel strongly about this either way? It's a new one for me, so. No. Okay, so we'll see where it goes. And then, um, and I'll, we'll just try to understand from our lobbyists if it's supported and if it's on a on a track for success. And uh, so I just wanna- to see, Maybe Rob can look at it, but if it's starting at, Whichever house side it's starting in, it didn't have a sponsor in the other house or the Senate. That's what I noticed also. So I wasn't really sure. One thing I might say is there's a lot of misinformation in the community because I can't tell you the number of people I've talked to that think board members do get paid. Oh, and, yes. uh, they're always surprised, but but I, I think also that they do not realize the amount of time as we discussed today with, uh, in meeting with some of the candidates, uh, the, the reality of the time spent. I, I don't have a strong opinion either way at this point. Uh, I know of some people not in this state that are on school boards that get paid. And uh, I, I, I really need to investigate more what, what those advantages or disadvantages would be. Yeah, I think it's one of the benefits of being on the NSBA board is I asked them to investigate that. So maybe we can figure out a way to post that to board docs, Tina, if people want okay. to see what other states are doing. You know what? We can post it to our RFI library. Yeah, there we go. Does that, so sound that might help answer some of your questions too, because they did a thorough research of all 50 states and what's going on in every state as far as compensation to school boards. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, okay, uh, let's see, what else do we have? Just a very quick thing. Yeah. Compensation for elected positions, I think, are pretty vital uh, because it really allows people that can't afford to be on boards or whatever to at least want to make a try for it. Uh, and I know that if you look at our county commissioners, for example, uh, I, I'm sure that we're not going to get paid, but they get paid. <laughs> Would it be nice? <laughs> but but uh, uh, but I know that a lot of a lot to do has been made about the fact that uh, uh, people of color don't run for uh, elected mm -hmm. office because of the fact that they can't afford to, or yeah. once they get on there, they can't afford to stay on it. Yeah, I tried for a couple of years actually to get board members health benefits through the district because I thought that that might help people who didn't have a job to get them. But then it, it, it turned out that there, it's so restrictive that we couldn't offer any perks. In fact, we almost had a hard time with childcare for a moment um, because it kind of was viewed as a compensation and we, we worked around it, but um, it, is, it is very restrictive. So yeah, so maybe that, um, let me look into it and see what, what we can do, if anything. But to Kathy's point, it doesn't have another sponsor, so it just doesn't feel like it has momentum. Anyway, um, okay, Kathy, do you have anything you wanted to bring up? No, there's, well, I think for the next um, time we talk about it, I'd love to talk about the gun storage um, because I personally am in favor of it and I think it's working its way through the legislature. So. Maybe we could, it's not in our, um, I don't think it fits on our platform, so we would need to figure out if we would have a resolution supporting it or what we should do, but I'd like to have that conversation, um, especially given the, 
the awful events that happened in our own community around that. And I don't know any details other than what I heard tonight. Um, and then there's a whole, there are a couple of bills coming up that we could talk about in two weeks around. I guess we're not going to be able to talk again, Tina, are we until April? No, and this is the problem with the legislative session. So um, it, the timing is terrible. <laughs> so the, the March forecast comes out next week. And so when we meet again, and I guess it's not till the second week of April, we'll know a whole lot more. Um, and maybe we should make sure we allocate enough time on that agenda to, to talk about because the accountability audit bill will be going through, the teacher evaluation bill will be going through. We'll know a lot more about the budget. Um, so that would be my recommendation because it's getting late and we have some really important UIT stuff to do, but maybe we just make sure we allocate enough time in April to because I think we'll know a lot more then. Does that make sense? And I don't know how the, um, the the specifics of the bill, and and I have looked at it because I have interest in, in that as well. But but I really even think even as a district or state or however they um, uh, decide to go with this um, is is part of the health curriculum. I think it should be covered, um, and and I think sometimes we we lack that in. Uh, Kids, you know, they they see these things and guns on on shows on TV, but but there's no um, standard whether it's curriculum or process. I know you can opt in to after school uh, safety things, and we can have speakers come in, but I I, I wish it could be part of um, a, a being able to give. Some kind of curriculum and that as part of the safety in in your homes whether it's through medication through drugs alcohol gun safety ought to be in there too okay um sorry i just had a slight interruption in my quote unquote office um uh i have a procedural question kathleen um can i can so in the legislative session, can we support legislation assuming it's not policy just by a nod of heads or no? Yeah, I think you can because I don't think that that is, um, if you're not adopting a formal resolution, you're, it's consistent with the legislative platform approach that the board took. I mean, we have a le you have a legislative platform. Are you talking about taking positions on additional items, or sort of well, agreeing the, so, on how to proceed within that? Right. With with the gun storage bill, we don't have a legislative platform, and we won't meet until April, whatever. So, and now it it may not. I think this bill is going to pass without our endorsement, so it may not be critical. But um, I'm just asking out of curiosity, can we just say, yes, we're going to support that at this meeting, or is that not properly noticed because it's something we've literally never talked about? Did the board vote on the legislative platform itself? Yeah. It did. Yeah. And that and this is part of the information section on the board agenda. Is that a section right. where you never vote? Or do you vote um, on items and information? No, we don't vote on information. We only vote in action. And I think procedurally, based on this board's practices, it might be appropriate to say, would this board like a resolution to come back when we do resume again? Okay. That would be a head nod as opposed to taking a formal position. Okay. All right. I was wondering what to do in this case. Um, so from head nod, would you all like a resolution for next time? Okay. And are we are we meeting in a work session next Tuesday? We are. Um, we've taken a few minutes to pass a resolution in the past just by adding 15 minutes. So if it feels like we're going to need to do that, is everyone okay if I do that too? So we'll check it out. Um, and that is uh, HP 21-1106. Um, all right. 
And I am also just still researching a bill called Fifth Day School Enrichment Programs Funding, HB 211006. And um, it's a little bit complicated, so I'm just trying to understand it. But the primary issue I have with it is that in the bill, it states that um, Colorado has more schools on a four-day week than any other state. 111 of Colorado's 178 school districts are on a four-day school week, representing more than 80,000 children. Many school districts made the decision to move to a four-day school week to address budget concerns and recognize the need for additional state support and investment in kindergarten through 12th grade funding in order to move toward a return to a five-day school week. That um, sentence is really oddly phrased. And then it goes on to provide funding. It has a fiscal note for um, nonprofits to provide educational programming on the fifth day. And the issue I have is not about kids having options on the fifth day. It's more about every district makes different decisions. So in Boulder Valley, we increase class size to maintain teacher salary and maintain five days. So do we only address certain types of decisions that districts made in order to make their budget work or do we address all types? Um, and the other piece is what's really interesting about this bill is it suggests that we're not going to remedy the root cause, which is a lack of funding to be open for five days. That's probably what concerns me the most. And I'm trying to discover if this is a complete surrendering of any hopes of more funding and we're just accepting the way things they are as they are today and we're not moving forward. So that's why I'm interested in that bill. Um, Stacy, Just for the public who are listening in, this is in non-COVID times. So I think that's really important to clarify yeah. that there are districts that are four days a week. We're not talking about COVID times. Right. That is really important. And it's not just rural. I, I was looking at the website for 27J, and they went to a four-day week in 2019 just because they felt it was a good idea for teacher planning and that their families would be okay with it um, and that it made sense for their budget. So, you know, I just, um, I'm concerned that we're going to start seeing a lot of bills to patch up a lack of commitment to provide reliable per pupil funding that does not have grants attached to it. And it's starting to carve out very specific use cases that all have the same root cause, which is a lack of funding from our state. So any comments or thoughts around that? Kitty? Yeah, I really agree with you, Tina, on this. If they're gonna be putting money towards education, put it into the schools, not into somebody else to provide the education. Yeah, so it's, yeah. exactly right on that. Um, and our legislative platform is pretty clear on this. So, um, you know, that's not something we'll need to take a position on. So, um, well, that's all I have from a legislative perspective. I think the prison, the pipeline didn't ha doesn't have a number yet, right, Richard? You mean school to prison? Well, we're supposed to have a, today's the ninth, isn't it? What? Today's the ninth. Today's the ninth. Is it yeah. supposed to drop today? We're supposed to have a draft today, and then uh, by Friday they should have uh, uh, a number. Okay. Well, so Tina, t um, when we're planning for the April meeting, given what I, I know it's a big shock that I totally agree with everything you just said about the way we're dealing with funding, we should think about the ballot measure that is, that's coming up too, because that's going to take some time to understand. It does the same thing only by ballot measure. And then there's a really weird bill called educator pay that's supposed to t educator pay raise funding, but there's no fiscal note attached to it. So we're, we're going to want to look at that too. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of crazy. Um, Lisa, did you have your hand up? Yeah, but I was just going to talk about the school to prison pipeline meeting Richard and I went to, and I feel like we covered it. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, we haven't, well, I think we have a discipline in our legislative platform, so we may not run into the same thing we're running into with the guns. So, okay. Um, all right, our next item, unless anyone has anyone else to, anything else to talk about. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. 
are our action items. I'll read them off and then I'll hopefully remember that we need to make a motion. 8.1, personnel items. 8.2, approval of minutes, February 23rd, 2021, special meeting. 8.3, approval of minutes, February 23rd, 2021, regular meeting. 8.4, award of a roofing services contract for bond funded improvements to Netherland Middle Senior High School. 8.5, cancellation of March 23rd, 2021, board meeting. 8.6, close out to the construction manager, general contractor, contract for bond funded work at Sombrero Marsh. 8.7, close out to the general contractor, contract for bond funded work at the Monarch High School. 8.8, .8, reduction in forced timeline. 8.9, resolution 2110 in support of a voter registration awareness week in DVSD high schools. Um, can I hear a motion to um, vote on these, to accept these? Thank you, Kitty. Can I have a second? Stacy, thank you. Um, would anyone like to pull an item? Okay, seeing none. Um, any questions or thoughts? Uh, I just want to actually highlight one is 8.9. That um, we have a really great uh, partnership with the uh, Boulder Elections Office and the Boulder County Clerk in terms of promoting voter registration. Uh, that's of course directly in our mission is to promote civically engaged lives, and I think they've been doing a phenomenal job giving our uh, students the opportunity to participate in our elections, and of course in civics in general. So, uh, any other questions? Okay, Laura, would you please call the roll? Uh, Garcia. Yes. Gephardt. Yes, but you know what, Tina? I just realized I have a question on one of the things. Can I ask really quickly? Uh, I can I ask at the end. It, it, it's something in 8.8 um, .8 that says that we're supposed to adopt a you just muted. There's, it says under 8.8, .8, we're supposed to adopt a resolution 21-11. Have we already done that? I don't understand what we're doing, but that's okay. I'm sure it's all fine. <laughs> well, I don't know if we can leave it at that. But, um, uh, Kathleen, can we interrupt a vote to ask a question? Well, this is advanced board meeting early. question night. I, I apologize for not seeing that earlier. <laughs> I don't know the answer. I would think at a minimum, if we're going to do this, you would need to restart the vote because we can't have a board member who had to vote before the question was on the table. Okay, so should I have a motion to take the motion off the table? Do I have to do it that way? I think I think the person who made the motion can just withdraw that motion and we can start over. Draw the motion. Okay, Kitty just withdrew the motion. Kathleen, Kathy, could you ask your question? Okay, no, you asked know. it. Rob, can you answer? <laughs> it says the superintendent recommends that the board discuss the reduction in force and procedure and adopt resolution 21-11. And I just don't know if we've already done that, if we have to do it, if it's coming forward. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead, Laura. You've got your hand up. Um, the resolution is not attached to board docs and it should be attached. My clerical error. Okay. So, All right, so the more yep. advanced questions for Kathleen. Now, should, can we restart the vote? Because the motion was from before, the motion was supposed to happen before the question. So what do I do now? I think we just start with a new motion. The point okay, is okay. to be clear about the board's intent. So let's just go with that. Okay. Kitty. I move we adopt the consent agenda. <laughs> and I, I move we pull 8.8 .8 since we don't have the resolution and we bring it up at a later date unless we're time constrained to do it now. Are we time constrained? Mike Gratos. Yes, it is. It is March 15th is the date on that. So you wouldn't have time. But this is uh, this is something we bring before the board every year as part of the negotiated agreement around the contract of if we were to have a reduction in force, we would already have notified the uh, the association. That's really what it is. So it's following the negotiated agreement with the resolution. 
Okay, so Kathy, would you like to withdraw 8.8? Yes, if we could just find a way to get 21-11 somehow included in the board docs so that if people wanted to go and read it, they could have access to it. And I might read it at some point too. Okay. So yeah, I'll withdraw it as long as we can get that resolution out for the public. Okay. Kitty's motion doesn't have a second. Stacy, thank you. Laura, could you please call the roll? Garcia. Yes. Gephardt. Yes. Marquis. Yes. Myers. Yes. Sargent. Sweeney Moran. Yes. This. Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Um, our next item is the district, our study items, and it, the first one is the District Unified Improvement Plan. Hi, Jonathan. Hi there. Uh, President Marquis, members of the board, Dr. Anderson, I'm pleased to be presenting the uh, rather highly anticipated based uh, with, with other items on the agenda, uh, uh, District Unified Improvement Plan. Um, I'll begin with sharing my screen here. Um, get this to go to presentation mode. Thank you. So, um, so what we'll do is we'll talk a little bit about the timeline under which this plan was made. We'll of course talk about district performance as a context, and then we'll go in the level of detail um, that we've chosen for this meeting, which we can obviously dive into more at any time, um, connecting the patterns we see in data with root causes and the strategies that we're proposing to be working on this, this year and next as documented in this particular plan. So the planning process begins obviously with looking at patterns in data. Um, and while there was not a lot of new data this year to look at in some traditional sources like test scores, um, we have long standing patterns that are very clear around gaps in achievement, growth, and op op opportunity uh, that, we, that we have. Um, uh, once working with those patterns in the data, we look at what our root causes would be that we would uh, choose to develop strategies to address. Many of the strategies that we develop come from the, the, the extensive work that had been done on our, our, our strategic plan, right? And then developing, therefore, this particular unified improvement plan involves picking from some of that work, quite frankly, and adding in some new work that we didn't necessarily have in the plan, such as around COVID catch up. Um, we then submitted a draft of this plan to, to DAC, and I, I would say this came in two, two pieces. One piece was presenting with them with the core logic of this plan in early January, and then presenting them a more uh, completed uh, version of the plan uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, so, uh, and this is in anticipation of your uh, um, uh, weighing in on this plan and are submitting this to CD by the middle of a April. Uh, and of course, uh, work is done, done in this plan to propose the work that's going to be done next year, knowing that there is some budget work that needs to follow um, in order to support the work that's being done. So our, our results as context, you know, we, we have uh, uh, every, every, every year we're assigned a, a district performance framework rating. The current rating that we have is accredited. Districts with, 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 with this rating submit a, an improvement plan every other year and therefore have plans that are two years in scope. Um, but also part of the performance framework, right, is to give us an idea of areas we need to improve to serve students better. Um, and we, we, we do this both looking at district data overall, but also working with schools. Uh, we, 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 we have a, we have a, a way of, a way of uh, um, having staff work specifically with schools to support their, their use of data and development of strategies. And in the course of that work, the S3M work is their acronym you sometimes hear, School Strategic uh, Support. Um, uh, that, that in the course of this work, we also inform uh, our thinking about uh, what, what we're seeing and therefore what we had progressed in, in our planning overall. Um, so the patterns and the results that we've seen um, for many years are high achievement. Uh, 
more recently, we've seen a pattern of very strong growth at, at, at high school and to some extent elementary. Um, and as we've looked harder, we've seen more differences in opportunity. But in all the metrics that we look at, uh, what we see are sig significant gaps for groups. Performance is not as strong generally for students in these groups um, uh, in, with regard to growth or achievement. Uh, and this has and this has its roots too in some of the opportunity metrics that we look at. Uh, but th this is a, a re this is easily defined for us as a persistent problematic pattern in our data data, whatever the data set we're looking at. Um, and, and what I would say is that we've talk, talked about in the, in the past, um, our, our idea that, that the information that's in the, the school performance framework, the district performance framework is important. It's growth, it's achievement, it's graduation rate, uh, dropout rate, uh, um, and some, some added information onto the top of that. Uh, but that, that our operating theory of action involves that we need to improve the opportunities that students have first um, once we improve opportunities and improve our service to them overall, um, that's when we'll see better growth uh, in, in uh, relative to the gaps that we see between groups and growth. And that, that's uh, it's only after we're doing that well do we see uh, significant gap closing with regard to achievement. So the opportunity um, gap work that, that we're, we're, we're looking at here uh, um, can, can be posed in terms of coursework, discipline, and special education education. So drawing an image from our, uh, our forth, 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 forthcoming draft uh, uh, dashboard, right, uh, we, we can look at this kind of representation where gray bars um, um, are, can, can be used to show the percentage of students in a certain group overall. And then bars can be overlaid on, on, the, on the top of those sh showing the Relative proportion uh, of of that 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 of that group's oppor, 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 opportunities. So what we see here, right under free and reduced lunch and advanced courses, is that uh, students uh, who are eligible for free and reduced lunch proportionally make a make up a much much lower share, uh, hence the the orange orange bar of all students taking an advanced course uh, of a certain kind. Um, uh, relative to, to what 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 they, what what their their uh, their what 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 the numbers that we see for them in the population. Conversely, for behavior incidents um, uh, and for being identified uh, as, as having an individualized educational plan, being special education, uh, we see that students on free induced lunch are over uh, represented that, that that way, right? So, so what we see is is a real illustration here of opportunity gaps that um, that that the that what we offer students isn't uh, is isn't isn't un, un, unrelated to their poverty status. Uh, same thing uh, when when we look with with with, with regard to uh, race and ethnicity, uh, we see the same kind of pattern of underrepresentation for the the, the, the Latino students in advanced courses in over-representation in behavior incident identification uh, and in, in terms of special education. So as we think about these patterns on top of our long-standing gaps in growth and achievement, um, we can come to, to, to pose these in, in pretty succinct priority performance challenges. Uh, which is the, the wording used in our unified improvement plan, every unified improvement plan, to talk about patterns in the data that are simply problematic for, for us. It is a problematic pattern that we have inequitable discipline. Um, the root causes that we focused on in this particular plan, um, and there are potentially other root causes to, to talk about, uh, have to do with uh, our, our, our simply in, in, in consistent gathering and use of school level data. Use of data to improve is a is a uh, the kind of strategy we all wish to engage in, and really all, all facets of the ma major work that, that we that we do. And it simply hasn't been possible because data is not gathered consistently. Um, you heard earlier this evening about significant inroads being made into that 
and some particular strategies being made, and you saw an illustration of the kind of reporting uh, that's done. But up until this point, this has been a significant issue, um, and I would point to it over my many years in Boulder Valley, um, having inconsistent gathering of the data. But we recognize this isn't just a problem about data and how it's used. This is also a problem about strategies um, and how they are used in, with, with, within buildings consistently or not consistently, and certainly inconsistently across buildings. Um, so the, the idea here is that two potential root causes around it to discipline really have to do with our gathering and use of data and the kind of strategies that we engage in uh, with students. So um, the, the particular strategies that we're, we are thinking are, are, well, they're laid out in some more de detail in this particular plan, which is of itself, you know, sort of a subset of all the things that we are, are doing, right? We, we, could, we could make this more expansive potentially uh, to show work that's being done, but we, 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 we are seeing that there's system-wide strategies um, to, to, to go, go after and how we gather the data and how we talk about data and how we train leaders to use data and in terms of uh, how we train folks in buildings to use strategies in working with students. Um, we can talk about this more. There's certainly been good conversation this evening uh, from Kathleen about all the good work that's been done uh, this year and the work that's being done for the next year. But um, that's, this is a succinct version of that and we can obviously talk more. Um, what, when we think about the um, really substantial uh, long-term gaps that we've seen, uh, we have huge achievement and growth gaps by, 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 by group. And th those gaps, um, based on a, a attendance data and other d data we have, it is, it's plain that we have every reason to believe that those gaps are likely to have gotten widened during the re remote, remote learning portion of, uh, uh, our, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the pandemic. Um, so, so, you know, the root causes we can point to here um, and they're, they're more than just these, but these are the ones we're choosing to focus on for this plan uh, have to do in the immediate term, right? We, we do have some limited ability to deliver sufficiently engaging construction re 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 remotely. We have good data to suggest that this is uh, problematic, um, but important there too is a, a, a somewhat broad uh, uh, no notion about inconsistent instructional delivery. Um, that really refers back to what we see uh, in patterns that we've seen over many years and is not the and is not simply related to what's happened during during remote learning. Uh, um, the, the, and, the, and when we think about that, it's it's um, not using practices as if, 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 if effectively, um, not being as consistent. Uh, not having a common scope and sequence of curriculum. Um, so we've, we've caught a number of uh, uh, important features uh, uh, in, in, this, in this idea of our root cause. The kind of strategies that we propose to talk about that are somewhat specific to, uh, to the, the to remote learning, right, and how we're thinking about it. Um, you've had a presentation for, for fairly recently about COVID catch-up. Um, that, 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 that's an example of work that's very much specific to uh, uh, how, how do we um, make near-term in, inroads into uh, some of the gaps that we're seeing in performance in students and some of the, and with some of these being gaps we know from long-term, but others being related to specific needs that students have that we've identified. But the broader strategies here uh, part and parcel of our strategic plan have to do with improving instruction. Um, and, and, the, and the nature of that in, includes both training principles and being able to lead more effectively with the data so that people can, can re 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 reflect on their instruction uh, and the su successes that they're seeing overall, uh, but, but also um, work, working, working with regard to the foundational foundational strategies that are part of our strategic plan. Work to improve instruction, work to improve 
curriculum, uh, um, work, work to uh, uh, improve the use of assessment as part of instruction um, are, are all an important piece of what we're uh, look, looking at here. So, um, one, you know, one, one thing that we'll see is we, if we choose to dig into the particular implementation benchmarks and action steps, uh, right, is that um, sometimes a whole lot of important work gets folded into a single line. Um, and that when we talk about developing protocols to use system-wide for observation of instruction, um, uh, also known as innovation configuration maps, um, that's actually uh, important large work that rolls a lot of, uh, a lot of important strategic work into, uh, into the process whereby uh, um, peer observation and uh, administrator observation will be an important tool in, in looking at progress over time. Um, so uh, a more, um, uh, so, so a, the, on a third, 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 third line, and I take it we're going to just finish this page and then, and then, then, then we'll hear questions. Uh, when we talk about the, 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 the disparities we're seeing in acceleration, um, we see a number of root causes for, for, the, for, the, for, the, for, the, for that, right? One, one of these is a lack of clear pathways to ex accelerate students. Um, and in some cases, those pathways varying by school uh, in terms of what's offered and what isn't, isn't offered, uh, particularly at elementaries. Um, but we also see systemic barriers to enrollment and accelerated coursework. Uh, the barriers we can, we can talk about might include things like summer reading lists, might include teacher recommendations, May, may, may include having uh, pre prerequisites that aren't as uh, uh, that aren't necessary to be constructed in the way that way that they are, and may even include limitations on number of sections of a course that's that's offered um, uh, in that way. So uh, um, the the kind of strategies that we talk about uh, in order to address this are multi. They're ones that explicitly address this through offering a particular uh, dual credit courses uh, and, and expanding that kind of work to uh, make sure that there there are opportunities in in the, that in that way, uh, coupled with some efforts to to, to, to re recruit students effectively into the, 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 those. Um, there is work. There was work that was done this this year to make sure that that fifth fifth graders who's, who are interested in taking a sixth grade math course had, had that opportunity uh, uh, by, by participating in a, in a hybrid course online uh, taught by experienced teachers uh, 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 who were, uh, were working as, working at the level in, 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 in a STEM, um, so so we can have some real specific examples like that of ways in which we attempt to meet a need across the the, the district uh, and make that available across schools. Um, there are some more forward-looking pieces too about how you have communicate community conversations about uh, what pathways ought to look like. Um, this is certainly a topic that parents have some real interest in. Uh, finally, on the bottom line here, uh, the issue of disproportionate identification for special edu education. Uh, we, 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 see, we, we, see, we see that this broadly is being related to inconsistent use of student level data um, to adequately inform planning. Uh, we, we, we see this as, as uh, not having the right variety of interventions to meet student needs that should be identified through the use of student level data to inform planning over time, uh, leading to a circumstance in which students are, uh, are, are not uh, appropriately met where they are uh, fast enough in their careers and, and, and end up being uh, put into identification processes for special education. Um, 
so as we think about this, right, we we have some some need to remedy this based on strategies that we have a, that that are being provided as far as the interventions, but we have other tools for doing this too. Uh, some of which involve um, get, uh, improving the manner in which which students are actually ex 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 exited from special education, um, and the in the need to do this uh, 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 more effectively over time, based on the idea that some students who were, were identified for special education over over time wouldn't have been had there been better procedures uh, in place from. From from the instruction on, this is not about the identification process being bad. This is about all the work that that would go on go, going up to, up to that. Um, but then, once there is an identification process uh, for a particular student, improvements that are made to that that process to make it more culturally sensitive, to make it more cognitive of ling linguistic differences uh, in in needs, uh, and to help improve that work over time. Um, so um, that's a moderately high level overview. Um, we can go into this into any level of detail that folks want. Uh, I know there were some advanced questions about uh, work with DAC and that. Um, President Mark West, how would you like me to proceed? So, um, and this is the end of the presentation, correct? Yes, fantastic. Um, I was just thinking we should ask questions. At this point, is that, are you okay with that? Awesome. Um, so, if you don't mind, I'll just go alphabetically again. Richard, do you want to start? Jonathan, thank you for that presentation. Uh, a lot of information here. Uh, you know, in the abstract sense, I seem to understand this a little bit, but then when I look at it concretely, what are we going to be doing and when are we going to do it? And how is it going to get done? You know, like for example, when I look at achievement growth gaps uh, likely widening during remote learning, well, no, they've been they've been wide even before remote learning. Uh, and uh, uh, what kind of strategies I, I, do we have in place? I mean, concretely, I guess that's that's the part that I want to understand better. And then uh, on the academic acceleration, I know that I've been really, really uh, persistent in terms of bringing up the subject of the number of Latino kids that are not in uh, AP classes, et cetera. And I also had a conversation with uh, Rob, our superintendent, about uh, 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 trying to do something intentional, at, at least as it relates to some of our students, that could get uh, uh, some more concrete activities going so that they could uh, uh, meet that major improvement strategy that you're talking about uh, and, uh, in, in terms of accelerated coursework opportunity strategies. Uh, concurrent enrollment was one topic that, that I'd like to see uh, some very intentional, concrete strategies that could be put in place so that we could actually get people in and get uh, some of our students that uh, might be able to benefit from that. So those are the kinds of questions that I have in terms of, uh, uh, you know, when you get to the major improve, improvement strategies, what are some concrete examples? I know you gave some a while ago, but what else can we do and how soon can we get it done and, right. and uh, that kind of stuff? So, so really big work that's being done this year at, a, at, a, at, a, at, at our high schools uh, is work, work, work around the Equal Opportunity Schools project um, that that uh, that uh, work which is documented in the plan with some specific steps um, has to do, do with uh, uh, putting putting uh, in, in place a good understanding of what the the the, 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 the disparities are in advanced course enrollment at high schools um, surveying students and teachers to get a better understanding of what the school culture is, but also to ask students questions so, so they can um, they can help give us information that'll help us know how to communicate the better we with them, such as through a trusted adult 
who can be the one who helps encourage them to take advanced courses. Um, now that that's only part of the work, but uh, but the 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 the, the, the idea of um, um, helping to target the way in which we encourage encourage students of color, particularly, to take advanced coursework, uh, is a major part of this of this work with the Equal Opportunity Schools program. Uh, we will hope to have some data uh, to to report 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 report, report out on uh, uh, once we know the enrollments for next year. Uh, but we will, will be able to t t talk then about what what improvements we've seen in, in enrollment of advanced courses, particularly things like AP and IB. Um, so that would be one, one example of big concrete work that's being done this school year um, uh, that, that is focused on that. Um, now, as far as the, the concurrent enrollment part of that, uh, that's obviously not the same, 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 same thing, right? But uh, there's been work done this, this year to uh, to improve opportunities so that there are more ways for students to take courses. Um, uh, and there were four particular uh, sections of two, two courses being offered. I think it's a psych course and a computer science course um, that's new with an, an aim to expand the number of students taking courses. Uh, and through the targeting of that work, and I apologize that I've run out at some point of the level of detail in which I can uh, talk about this, uh, n n not just to simply improve it o overall, uh, but to do some t t targeting of let 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 Latino students in particular. Um, so that that would speak to that piece. Now, on growth gaps, um, the. The foundational work of the strategic plan is around instruction. I mean, there's obviously other things that we're we're working on on, 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 on too. But the most recently convened work is is a is a round of uh, around the work of the the district and instructional leadership team. Um, and while uh, there are others on this call who can go into more detail on that, then than, than I, I can, um, perhaps. Uh, the fundamental idea there has to do, do, do with teachers and administrators at each school um, uh, uh, bringing, bringing to their schools uh, understandings of uh, what it will mean to have a common, common scope and sequence, uh, what it will mean to use Common tools around uh, at, at the benchmark level in the unit level, uh, and and uh, and and engaging in the the uh, particular instructional strategies that are part of the plan also. Um, so that that work is uh, uh, work for the long haul, right? Um, uh, uh, so. Um, so uh, and and is built very 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 much on the patterns we've seen over time, and not simply on the on the ones that we've um, talked about here. Uh, um, I don't know if Rob or anybody else wishes to add to to to, the, to that, but um, and, and I will apologize in advance if the level of, of detail that we get to doesn't always come through 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 in this plan, right? A challenge of writing any plan is. How long to make it? Um, we did a lot of good work in terms of our strategic plan of getting a lot of input on what it ought to be. Um, an amazing amount of work has been done by folks on staff, um, and and an even more amazing amount of work is going to be done by by teachers and principals in the coming coming years. Um, uh, uh, and in any case, at some point when I'm trying to boil this down into what fits in the format of a, 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 a Unified Improvement Plan. Uh, I would apologize in advance if the level of detail is a little un uneven, right? We could say more about certain things and not as much about uh, others, uh, um, and 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 that. So uh, no, but I, I do appreciate I do appreciate your explanation on, on on all of that and and the efforts that we're seeing from other uh, parts of the uh, the curriculum and instruction people and stuff like that. So I. I do appreciate that. It's just that some, you know, since since we've been talking about this uh, achievement gap, opportunity gaps, uh, 
accelerated growth or, or classes and stuff like that. Uh, it, it's been for a long time, you know, and, and, and I'm glad that at some point we're going to get to uh, a place that, that all the children will have opportunities, same opportunities or, or, or even targeted opportunities. I, 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 I do appreciate your explanation and, uh, and thank you for the work. I, I appreciate it. All right, uh, Kathy? Um, I'll echo what Richard said. Thank you, Jonathan, for this um, great work. I, I just have a question about your last bullet on the disproportionate identification for special education, and then I'm looking at the actual UIP. I think it's pages like 28 through 35 for you talk more about that. And I know that we're already trying to figure out how we're going to improve our MTSS. So without getting into a ton of detail, can you, I mean, I guess we're looking at improved identification and can you just give me a little more detail, like at 500 feet, not 50 feet as to what we're doing to address that issue? Absolutely. So, um, so you, so you, you, you do really, really, really well, 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 they're there to, to, to just, remind us of the work that was done around empty, empty, empty out there, right? Because it's the the fundamental ideas in a multi-tiered system of, of, of supports. Uh, one, 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 one of the ideas is working with the data to understand what students aren't getting uh, and trying, trying uh, a series of strategies to, to help them, help them uh, Succeed at the academic work that they have at, the, at their grade level. Um, so the so the, the, there is a mention absolutely in this in this plan uh, of uh, um, circling back to making sure that we we assess again at the school level how well are we doing that? How well are we working with data? Um, how well are we meeting students' needs? Uh, how well are we at the appropriate time in that in the process of look, looking 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 engaging teams uh, and and the, the appropriate time on that team to engage parents also. So we, we would see the basic strengthening of that work and the the, the reflect, reflecting on past work that's been done to even improve what we have uh, as as one of the important strategies. But there are other pieces too, right, that involve um, uh, making sure we gather data effectively on students uh, now, right? Um, I, I would say that, that that's an area we can imp improve on over time. Um, and, and, that, um, and that as we do that, that work, um, we, we lay the foundation for students' needs being met effectively um, before uh, we get, get to the point where after a series of things, interventions happening, needs aren't being met, and there is now, a, 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 um, there's now the information, there's now a, a, a concern at the low level that it does, that it does indeed warrant um, referral for, to a special, identifi special ed identification. Um, so um, I, I've tr tried to make that the 500 foot view um, Please let me know if I can say more that would be helpful or if others on the call can add details. No, I, I don't want to spend a whole lot more time on this. I think one of the issues, and I'll probably send an RFI on this, I don't know how big the difference is in our disproportionality and identification. I don't know. Maybe I've seen data on that and I just didn't pay attention to it, but I don't know what that looks like. I know what it looks like in discipline. I just don't know what it looks like in that identification. And then I know that we have significant gaps for special education, so I think along with the disproportionality, I think we, I would love to know at a later date, kind of what we're doing on the um, MTSS to try to close those gaps for special education, but not tonight. Rob? Just really quick, um, I, I think, Kathy, you're, you're, you're hitting on the right points, and Jonathan is right to bring up the, the idea of a multi-tiered system of supports. Um, you know, and as we think, uh, board members, and we spoke to this when we, we presented to you our strategic plan, and some of the deliverables and things that we're going to be working on, you know, the importance of just having a very sound instructional infrastructure, right? Like if we prioritize standards, right, we provide schools the resources that they need and, and the clarity in regards to an instructional model, 
then and only then can you build out a multi-tiered system of supports that then supports students in learning those standards. Right, as we've tried to, from, a, from, a, from an infrastructure standpoint, roll out MTSS in the past, teachers were all choo choosing and teaching different standards, right? So then it becomes a very much an individualized um, system as opposed to kind of, 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 of more of a district support. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that, I believe next week at our work session, um, as we think about walking you all through a deep dive on some of the strategic plan um, stuff, and that's what we have planned for next week. So um, more to come on that, but the right questions, um, you know, I think that that uh, this is a, a really great presentation by Jonathan and is really starting to connect the dots between UIP, strategic plan, goals of the district, um, and we're going to, you know, just really excited about the alignment. Here's the excitement. Thank you. All right, uh, Donna. Yeah, I don't have too much more. I said it earlier. Thank you, Jonathan, for the presentation. A lot of work put into it. I, I still have, and maybe it's just me and my own issue with um, root causes and uh, corrective action. I, I, I think we have to go deeper. <laughs> it's just my own opinion on the root cause. I think we can collect and be really good about data collection. And I've seen it over and over in special education. I I worked at one point where I sat in rooms where we analyzed that we had over identified several English English language learners and and the root cause was not I mean the data showed okay they're way behind but the root cause uh, w was not inconsistent data it, it, it was being tested in the wrong language, uh, number one, uh, was one of the issues. And and some of the strategies we were using that where they didn't have the background knowledge that, but there was not really a, a significant um, disability that, and, and the state even caught us and we had to back up and say, yeah, we, we've identified too many, but back on the in, inequitable discipline, uh, like I said, that, uh, there's so many other, there's some deeper root causes and having worked with some psychiatrists and psychologists at Boulder Community Hospital with several students that I've had over the years, there's some root causes that go pretty deep into the behavior patterns that all the data in the world at the school level wasn't going to solve. And so I'm just, I, I, I just, as I think about it, I think digging deeper into a few root causes would, um, would help me because some of those, like I said, are corrective actions. They're not necessarily a root cause, but thank you. Um, that's all. I, I, I'm sure I'll learn more at the work session. Okay. Uh, Kitty. Um, I don't have any questions now. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, this was a great presentation. Thank you. All right, uh, Lisa. Thanks, I think it's all been pretty well covered, um, but Jonathan, thank you so much. And Stacy. Same, Jonathan, thank you. This was um, really informative and well thought out. I appreciate that, thank you. And I'll just add, um, I don't have anything much to say, but I have been looking at UIPs for probably 12 years. And I do notice a difference with these two UIPs in terms of just the um, the feeling of will we start making more progress on these gaps, as Richard pointed out. And I do feel that we have a tighter connection and how we're going to track the progress in a more frequent way, um, so that it's not just a every year, six months after on CMAS. And I think that'll be more transparent to the community and to the board. Um, and so that's all I want to say. So thank you very much. All right, so did someone say something? Okay, uh, our last item is agenda setting. Does anyone want to talk about something? I'm looking around, not seeing any hands. All right, well, with that, um, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Have a good night.